It's been a bit, guys, but the Four Horsemen are back, and today we will be discussing Hexes and Optics lawsuit against the Call of Duty League, or CDL. A lot of you asked for this, so we have brought in our guest, Harris Peskin, who talks about the salary cap on Summoning Insight. He's a lawyer from ESG. But before we begin, guys, you know, I thought that we were going to have one week of Four Horsemen where we didn't have to talk about something incredibly stupid that Riot has done. And we're not going to get mm. deep into this, but they did announce the title of their fighting oh, game today. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> Which, Incredible. I, 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 as, as I try and say this out loud for you guys. It sounds I actually, like Sanaya. Come on, hit me with it. I, I actually don't know how to say the name of the fighting game. Is it mm. two I times? It's two, sorry, spell, I believe it's two X chaos. The premise, right? It, yes, I think that's what they're but implying. But is it two times knockout? Is it two X knockout? Is it two X KO? It is truly just an absolute abomination of a game name. I thought Valorant was bad, but this is—they've really taken it to the next level. Thoughts on the name of their fighting game, previously known as Project L? The joke I mean, is, I thought yeah. it was like an Elon Musk had another kid or something. <laughs> All right, okay. He's gone with the Elon Musk joke. Yeah, That's good. Yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 I was going to say, like, the, the, the hilarious part of it being called Project L the entire time is, of course, oh, you know, all, 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 the, all the TikTok dancing Zuma bullshit around taking L, hold this L. And you're oh. like, obviously, they've had, to, they've had to put up with that all that time. Like, ah, shit, right? Just tank it. And then they've actually conceivably come up with a name worse than Project L. Not and you it. go on the announcement YouTube video, all those people who were mocking them for taking the L originally, you're like going, can we just change the name back to Project L? It's like, <laughs> it's so staggering bad i don't know how they managed it actually yeah that, that, that that's my thought just riot things just idiots <laughs> like just a collection of as long as the game is good i i was a huge fighting game fan <laughs> <laughs> well, since the problem i got my wires crossed i heard riots working on a beat em up and i thought that was that whole thing with the spanish and french fans at lec <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't, i'm not supposed to mention that one that with real life violence guys my bad <laughs> I just don't understand when they already have like appropriate fighting game terms within the League of Legends. Like they don't even tie it to the League of Legends world. They could have called this game Lethal Tempo and it would have been perfectly fine. So and fast. also wholly unique. And it's it's just a it's it's just a rune in League of Legends, right? So I don't know. It's it is baffling the decisions that are made sometimes by Riot Games. Uh, I actually think they've but, been okay. I, I think they've been generally all right on their naming conventions. Like I, Valorant is a bit cringe, but it, like everything they bad. do is a bit cringe. It's, it's, nah. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't hate it so much. It fits in with what they're trying to. It, the, do. the thing is, is that it's not just called Valorant. It's that they they have it written in all caps. Which again, this new game also written in all caps. It's it's just getting a little tired. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what whatever. Uh, it's funny riot, riot riot in the fgc is a is a fucking match made in heaven anyway so <laughs> have, have fun with that can't wait like, to watch watch them tear, tear each other apart like. you guys were talking about uh, naming conventions and we were talking before the show um <laughs> about the naming conventions of some things that are used within the league of legends like ginsu and athena and mm -hmm. it's actually kind of funny because mm -hmm. it's kind of relevant you know <laughs> Going back all the way to Warcraft Three and Dota, so <laughs> talking about naming conventions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's always it's it's always the thing people forget about just what a piece of shit company they are. And I I never waste an opportunity to remind people. But one of the things they did was that back when they were first started, they said, "Oh, whoever gives us the most referrals, referral click throughs, you know, and signups for the game, will let you design a character and put them in the game." Yep. And so to Total Biscuit, huge legendary YouTuber, now sadly passed away. Um, you know, he went hard in the paint to promote their game, and he was way, you know, he back, back in the day, yeah, if you had over a million YouTubers, that was big. These days, like, everyone's got a million subs. You ain't shit until you hit a million, but back then, it was a big deal. He got a ton of signups, and then they just turned around and said, uh, nah, actually, we're not going to honor that. Sorry, it's too much work. So we'll put an item in that's named after you. Like, you can have this total biscuit of fucking re rejuvenation. Rejuvenation, yes. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and just some shit little freebie item you get. And he was like, uh, nah, I only promote Dota from now on, homies. <laughs> and then and then went on a massive Dota binge. Just a shower of pricks, all of them. Assholes. All right, then. 
Shall we talk about some Activision? Here's the thing, Monty, speaking about names, do you have anything you to say about potentially the title sponsor of this episode? <laughs> yes, uh, I, I, I do, actually. Well, and... well done, Dunk. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That would be weird if I asked that. He wouldn't, you, saved you, know? it. you saved it after period and dead air. Perfect. Exactly. <laughs> totally seamless, that one. Uh, we do have a sponsor this week, guys. Um, and as we said on many of our other shows, the best way to support our shows is to support our sponsors. So Factor Meals is here. You may have seen this on some of other LFN's content. Uh, Factor does make ready-to-eat meals uh, that are then shipped to your house that are both cheaper and frequently better for you than delivery, guys. So it's restaurant quality. You get them. You pop them in the microwave for two minutes. Uh, get a box at your door. It's the same company that does HelloFresh if you guys have used their meal kits previously. You can also add on snacks, smoothies, anything else into your box. Um, so if you have, if you don't have a lot of time, if you have been finding yourself ordering out a lot of food, this is really a better option. You can get keto food, calorie smart food, vegan food, vegetarian food, absolutely everything you need. They send you boxes of 16 meals per week that you select on the website. You can pause or reschedule your deliveries at any time. So it's great for you guys. If you are busy, uh, and if you'd like to use our code, you can head to factormeals.com slash horseman 50, not Men plural, horseman fifty, and use code horseman. It was, uh, it was the stream of Vosh that came up with that referral code. So <laughs> yeah. that's right. Obviously, there's man a lot of bunch of horseman jokes just waiting to be made there. Of course, you know. <laughs> of course, of course. So horseman fifty and use code horseman fifty to get fifty percent off. That's code horseman fifty at factormeals.com slash horseman fifty to get. 50% off. So worth a tr worth this trial at the very least, guys. Um, and thank you very much to Factor for sponsoring Four Horsemen and the other shows on the LFN network. So thank you very much. And again, guys, this is the time you're looking to try. Do it now. Help us out. Uh, we love to have more sponsors on our shows so we can continue to do things for you like make the Four Horsemen. Men, not man. All right. Uh, thank you. Let's get into this because this, this lawsuit we had to talk about because the implications of this are absolutely enormous for the esports industry. And it all goes back to the fundamental esports conundrum, which is why do the publishers who own the IP have complete dominance and control over the esports scene? Because as you've probably heard us say many times, nobody owns the intellectual property of basketball or football or soccer, which means that while it might be difficult to go create a rival league to the NBA, it is in theory possible for it's a bunch of very point. rich people, yeah. you know, to go make contracts with the all the great NBA players and create some sort of rival league. And in fact, most American sports leagues were actually born out of the mergers of rival leagues that previously existed. Um, so in this Great instance, context, actually, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in this instance, um, it, we have a very interesting scenario where it is not possible in esports to run competitions without developer slash publisher approval. Do you want to talk about this, Harris? Like the the legality that we're dealing with here. Yeah, I mean, I Do think you want to introduce enough. Harris first so we can yeah. frame his expertise. <laughs> So Harris, Harris, you saw, I have seen on Summoning Insight previously talking about the salary cap. He is an attorney who works for ESG Law, which is a law firm that represents mostly teams within the esports space. Is that fair to say, Harris? Yeah, that's fair to say. We, you know, we obviously have been involved in, so just as at a high level, um, we were the ones negotiating the team participation agreement uh, that is actually discussed in this complaint. I guess it was back in 2019 or 20. I can't remember the exact year, but we, we negotiated that on behalf of, I want to say 70% of those teams. And so a lot of the times what will happen is like, we're kind of just all getting together and we're saying, like, okay, what are the things we want to talk about? What are the things we like, we don't like, and we'll kind of push back on it. Um, yeah, th thank you for the introduction and thank you guys for having me on. I think that at a, at a really high level, as you mentioned, Monty, it kind of comes back to everything around the Copyright Act, right? Like, so absolutely every right that they, that, you know, under the sun, is basically claimed by Activision Blizzard by virtue of the fact that they have what amounts to 
a copyright in Call of Duty. And that's the game that we're talking about here right now, right? So there's exclusive rights conveyed by the copyright, particularly Section 106. And what is essentially claimed then is that derivatives of those of the work, which is the copyrighted game, the Call of Duty game, derivatives of that, is an, the, the right to create derivatives is an exclusive right that is owned by Activision Blizzard under Section 106 of the Copyright Act, meaning the, the play and any kind of audiovisual display of that play would also be owned under Section 106 of the Copyright Act. Oh, so so this, this also applies, by the way, guys, to translate this for you into, for example, when c content creators make their own streams of playing games that you like. So League of Legends or YouTube videos or whatever that show the gameplay or intellectual property of that game. Technically, the publishers also have rights over that. And you'll see on their websites that companies like Riot or Activision Blizzard give license, open licenses to use that to make money for your own content. Right, Harris? Actually, That's the correct. reason, by the way, I have never featured any in-game footage on my channel ever beyond, like, I guess, the screen where you do the stickers. Because I, even though it wasn't the case, I actually was always just thought, like, essentially, any time Riot wanted, they could just go, let's just shut this whole channel down and just put a bunch of cases on there and just wreck me instantly. So yep. even though in theory they don't, like, as you say, Monty, they in theory grant the license. I mean, there was a famous case where they did do this. It was that guy with this, like, Spectate Faker. Okay, All he Faker's was doing was using using the client yeah. to watch him normally like OPGG yeah. wasn't doing anything weird and then they came in because it was their right that's the thing people didn't understand they, they were technically allowed to say this and that was the one time they were going to revoke that sort of open right they were just right. going to tell this guy that's weird and then shut him down and, right. and the and reason actually, why they, they don't do this is because obviously they want people to make content for marketing reasons and also if while they could as in the spectate faker incident uh, have a heavy hand and come in, it is very bad PR for them to single people out um, and also discourages people making content because they people think, well, I'm making content. What, why would I do this if I could be next? Right. So there are real reasons not to do it. But it's important that this is not only we stress that it's not only applicable to esports, it is applicable to all the ways in which people use the intellectual property of the game. Right. And that basically stems from a reading of a case back in 1983. It was called um, Midway. And not to get too much into the case, but the basic idea behind the old guy who basically wrote that opinion 40 years ago was that a, an, an East, a video game is more, is more analogous to like a, is more analogous to like um, a dictionary where you could basically just you know, place certain words and certain things, but everything is kind of contemplated ahead of time by the the programmer who is putting together that, you know, that framework. Every any kind of iteration of that game is kind of contemplated. So we're going to give the game developer or the publisher all ownership of the things of all potential iterations of that. It's more akin to that than a painting or a a literary work. So a good example would be like consider Microsoft Paint, right? In theory, there is a limitation on the number of iterations of things that could be put in Microsoft Paint. That limitation is the number of pixels that are on your screen times the number of com uh, times the number of, of colors that can be used. That is a, a theoretical limitation. But at the same time, we are not saying that the owner of Microsoft Paint, the program, owns all iterations of paintings that could be put on Microsoft Paint. That would be a ridiculous assertion, right? But that's kind of what we're dealing with here, right? That, that that's, a, that's an in-depth area of copyright law, not to get too far into the weeds on that, but that's the distinction that we're drawing. One distinction is, on the, on the one hand, you know, we're contemplating that any kind of potential use of this or any kind of derivative is contemplated, you know, but when it's fixed in that program. The second is, we, we think that there's, this person can exert creativity. We're not going to give the, the programmer all ownership of that kind of stuff. And that's that's kind of what we're talking about in this context here, Monty. Russia Fair actually as well, funnily enough, just it's kind of related. Obviously, I, I don't think Russia and you know, China particularly as countries have a lot of respect for copyright law, if my experiences have taught me anything. But um, they're trying to get a bill pushed through the Russian parliament at the moment because they obviously are now international pariahs because of their invasion of Ukraine, they are worried that people might not want their intellectual property being hosted in their country. That there's like a risk that dev game developers might say, we're not selling our game in your country. And by extension, you can't run esports tournaments 
rights in your country. It's our IP. So they're trying to pass a law at the moment that would allow people to run esports tournaments without the developer's approval. I don't know about the practicalities of applying that or what it would look like, but it's definitely something I've got my eye on because I think it's super interesting. I think the best thing that could happen for esports, honestly, would be some kind of either free use exemption uh, fair use exemption, rather, sorry, if, uh, so people could use it freely within reason, uh, or a licensing agreement like you have in music or something like that. Licensing. I think if, uh, yeah, I think if we had something like that in esports, so you could be free of the tyranny of the developer, all of a sudden the space gets a lot more interesting right. and. No, oh, undoubtedly yeah, profitable. It would be huge. And like, clearly, I think uh, I, I will I will add this caveat on behalf of Harris, but that's clearly in Harris's client's best interest because the teams mm. are not particularly big fans of being under the boot heel of the publishers because, it, you know, the, the way that they extract the most value is if they became an American style, uh, you know, sports league, basically a team owned league where they would actually reap all of the potential rewards of that as opposed to being forced into the intermediaries of the developers uh which is right. well, I, you know what i, I, I what think and i were working those on with days are over. Th th those days are over i don't think i think developers are going to look at all the legal problems that have come tumbling out of these developer owned leagues and their attempt to run franchise leagues without having the proper legal requirements around them um, and I think most developers now are going to outsource. I think that's the future. Like, I, I don't think well, a developer is ever going to attempt anything like the Overwatch League or the fucking but, CDL ever again. But but the thing is, is that they're always going to take an ownership stake, right? They I don't a see a world. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. It's but, a question but, 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 license too. Yeah, exactly. I, I think if you look at, like, the system some other uh, games developers operate where they, you know, they treat it like, you know, Valve or Microsoft. You, if you're a production company, you go and uh, apply for the license and yep. it's essentially a pitch. And then they grant you the rights to host the tournament. And, and honestly, like, you know, they're not looking for a profit share or any of that stuff. It, you know, it's often just like they want to have certain input you know certain types of input into what the product looks like and how it plays and what you do with it and what associations it has with and what sponsors you plaster on it it's more about that kind of thing but but uh, you know i think i think the day of franchise leagues are fucking dead you know you need like you need a players union you need a team owners union you've got all you know before you can even get around and collectively bargain you can't put in the salary caps like they've tried to do if you try and do anything clandestine behind the scenes you're gonna get fined you're gonna get sued you're gonna get fucked over you've you know if your company has a negative headline in the games that you make it spills over into the esports product you run if you lose you you hemorrhage yeah. sponsors because of what bobby kotick's been doing even though he, he doesn't he doesn't really give a fuck beyond you know will this make me money so it's like it's super i i think all the complexities uh, it's you know games developers believe they can do anything you know it's just like a recurring issue they're super fucking up their own ass about their own capabilities they think they can get away with anything you know they're microdosing lsd at lunchtime and they think they're fucking dr manhattan you know most developers are just fucking cretins they're like downstream from silicon valley very egotistical think they're super, think they're smarter than they are i think these franchise leagues have basically taught them a very hard lesson about the realities of trying to be a sport and what you have to have in an american uh in an american setting you know well, i also uh, think I, it's i don't think they'll do it again I, I also think it's like kind of important to understand the history of professional sports, at least in America. Um, you know, right. I can't necessarily talk to the, the history of professional sports. And I do appreciate uh, that this episode is going to be a lot of like the Putin interview. Like, well, to answer that question, I'd have to take you back to the beginning of sport when man <laughs> Krog got a baseball bat. And then, you know, so go on, here's with it. Here's with it. Take us back into the time machine, the DeLorean. Go on. All right. <laughs> Uh, no, no. I, I mean, like in the 1800s, you basically had baseball, right? <laughs> yes, you and... can go in the 1800s. Keep going, keep going, keep going. This is, wrong. Sure yeah, this is where it starts. Yeah, yeah, this, yeah this is where it starts in the 1800s is baseball, right? You had you had clubs where people would actually pay to join a club and play competitive baseball. They paid to join a club, okay? Mm -hmm. And then that got really popular. And they're like, you know what? People want to watch people play, you know, in these clubs because we enjoy this kind of thing. And then in the North during the Civil War, 
that was their, their form of entertainment. And people would go while the while the troops were stationed at a base, they'd go watch those people playing in clubs. And then eventually what ends up happening is you, you get a bunch of people saying, oh, like we're making money off of this. And then their players are like, well, we want to get paid. And then there were prof- there were professional teams like, OK, like you want to get paid. You're a good player. You're drawing people tickets to the stands like here you go. We're going to pay you some money. And then they're like, well, this isn't fair. The Cincinnati Red Stockings are winning every single game because they're paying their players. And then they're like, oh. OK, we'll just combine all the teams that are paying their players. And that's actually the history of professional baseball and how we actually you know, got to kind of the National League in the 1870s. And so what is interesting is that like we never really had any of that kind of development in esports. We kind of just were like, OK, there's a little bit of interest. We're just going to force this down on you right now. We have no grassroots interest. We're getting a little bit. And we just got completely ahead over our skis. And I think that's kind of a lesson that is going to be hard learned by some of these developers. But my take on the issue is that we should be really reinforcing grassroots esports and building up kind of like we had over a 40 year period in the 1800s, as opposed to just jamming everything down people's throats when they're not quite ready for it and it hasn't gotten to its natural evolution point. And that's kind of how I feel about it. And to that end, by the way, I'm going to plug Smash because I'm a big Smash fan. I'm a big Smash fan. I look at, you know, my local that I have in my backyard. It's, it's a couple blocks away from where I live in Brooklyn. And it's a beautiful thing to see that every Sunday you're going to have 50 to 60 people come and they're all going to play this game that they love and they're all going to you know, compete in this tournament. And guess what? The person that wins that local, he goes to the majors and he goes to the regionals and every single person in that local is cheering for him while he's over there because they're, you know, he's part of this community. And that, in my opinion, makes up grassroots esports, And that's what it should be. And, and well, I love this. It's like you I actually live. Down. Your, your actual <laughs> life that you live them. is like the Amazon Prime series of esports lawyer who then like keeps down <laughs> with the people and goes to his local and then is the fucking open or whatever it is and like smash. I play it. all yeah, the yeah, time, yeah, man. Don't shut up. <laughs> position at three. Gotta run. Like you've got to have two stop or whatever. Like it's, it's perfect. It's, you know, listen, obviously demographically you wouldn't get the lead role, but you you could write it. Put it that way. You could write it. <laughs> I'm not that. Good of an actor, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what he meant. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I, I got. I you know, listen. I took what he meant, and I just the other way. <laughs> um. So, like, when when it comes to the actual the actual lawsuit that's presented here, it's important to have these this background because what this lawsuit is alleging could actually just completely flip this on its head, right? And it's not just. It could potentially not even just be video game stuff, Harris. Like. Is this big enough that it could flip into like fair use or other like IP? So I think it's really important to kind of talk a little bit about um, what is actually alleged here. Right? We talked a little bit about copyright. We talked about where Activision Blizzard gets its rights to kind of you know set the terms. That's at the top, right? What is essentially being alleged here is that its setting of those terms is a monopolistic behavior in violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act. And it's basically saying that even though you have the IP rights to this, you still can't have a monopoly, right? And so it's, in a sense, you know, I, I don't want to kind of opine on whether I think it's going to be a successful lawsuit or not, but I, I do think it's, it's novel and, you know, it certainly calls into question. And really what I think the main, if you were to kind of look at the, the biggest potential for impact, you would look at causes of action three and four, because those are basically alleging violations of section two of the Sherman Antitrust Act. And they're saying that Activision Blizzard sought to create a monopoly in violation of of Section 2 of the Antitrust Act. Now, the question really is, what is it? And that's kind of what I do in my article. I say, well, what is it Activision going to say to that? They're going to say, well, wait a second, we own all the copyrights here. So what the hell are you guys talking about? We have the exclusive right to do this. You can't tell us how to use our copyrights. And then that calls into question what is known in copy, in um, in antitrust law as a duty to deal. So the question that's going to be asked, and it hasn't been asked yet, but this is where this is going, is does Activision Blizzard have a duty to license or otherwise sell its license to essentially its IP in a specific market to potential competitors? That's essentially where this is going. That's the question that's being asked implicitly right now by um, by the plaintiffs. And what you could do is you could actually go down to the cause of action, the third cause of action. And in paragraph um, in paragraph 129, they're basically saying, you know, Hex, and Hex is saying, we want a permanent injunction 
terminating defendants ongoing violations so basically saying you cannot have a permanent we want the court to step in and say you can't have a monopoly in this area we want relief to be that you have a duty to deal to create this competitive ecosystem that we're talking about right now and that has the potential to essentially flip everything on its head because if they do have a duty to deal then that would mean that they have a duty to allow essentially competition in the marketplace by right. the way, a couple and, and, of things. One, if people missed it, because I, I feel like it's not explicit enough when we mentioned that thing you were talking about in the 80s, which, by the way, I'll correct you, was about 20 years ago and always will be, right? In the 80s, when that guy wrote that thing about why games should be allowed these particular rights, you have to remember people who aren't from that era that games were incredibly simplistic. In fact, literally, they were made by people in their bedrooms. So one of the reasons why I couldn't even see why that seemed reasonable at the time is that back then, the joke is, all I'd really need to do is have like the basic code of the game, and I could just tweak it, and then it'd just be like Thorin's version of like this platformer like i could sit whereas in the modern day like it's it's much less likely i'm going to make my own version of like super mario 64 some like super high tech game that requires all teams and stuff and then the other thing to say is this the reason why this actually seems like it could be an enormous case is literally in, it, for you obviously you hope that you win but i um, for my sake i think it should be enormous either side because it's logical one if it even comes close to winning as we're pointing out essentially i mean i hope it's obvious to people this wouldn't end with call of duty league it would be essentially every franchise league and it would actually then complete it essentially would break it would jailbreak all the open circuits again so that suddenly mm. every single like the joke is then mm. every game in theory could be open and, and then lastly if that starts to happen this is actually what I sadly cynically think will be more likely logically if like every other landmark type case like this the other side isn't going to take it lying down like you will see if they're actually scared because they can put billions of dollars behind this they can just do that thing that massive companies do where they just, you have like Hera and some other guy and then they have like 100 lawyers and people doing insane like like they're up all night long like some TV show just finding every possible angle and making all creative aspects so I imagine that that's I just want to see where the stakes get to buzzy I imagine this could actually be an I'll, insane case I, don't I, I can tell you that they're definitely livid about it I mean like I don't know if you saw the initial statement they put out like I expected them to say it's meritless like obviously you say that every time you're sued it's meritless like, it's just you throw it out there it's because that is what you're going to argue in call that's always going to be your first response you're gonna you know lawyers are going to pick apart what what shouldn't be in there in their opinion and they're going to cite cases that back up that opinion that's exactly how it goes so it's one of those things you can say and obviously you're it, it doesn't matter whether it's proven true or not you meritless fair enough but then what they said after that was they said we are disappointed that these members of the esports community would bring this suit which is disruptive to team owners players fans and partners uh, who have invested so much time and energy into the Call of Duty League success. Now, that is that phrase as well, like scolding is, you as you're doing it. Yeah, that is so bizarrely emotive in a statement of, of this nature. I don't think I've seen anything akin to that before. And then se second of all, the framing that scump, the second highest... <laughs> achieving player in the history of the game. The court. Yeah. And, and, and fucking Hector, who built not only one of the most successful organizations in Call of Duty, if not the most successful, but also the essential blueprint of what e people who came after Hector yep. wanted to make esports organizations, what, they haven't made a positive contribution. They're the disruptors, not Activision Blizzard, with their $27.5 million buy-in bullshit. Like it's, it's I just appreciate that the wild. response can just be boiled down to "son, I am disappoint meme." Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what, 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 what did weird. you make of that from a lawyer's perspective? I don't want to put you in a weird position where I'm, I'm getting you to comment, comment speculatively, but I guess some of that will will be what you have to explore. But were you surprised that they responded in with that second half of the statement? They're disappointed in the members of the esports community because it's a disruptive mm. suit. I mean, what's disruptive is that it has the uh, the potential to kind of completely shift, you know, the way the ecosystem has been run on its face. And they don't like that because they like to have all the control. That's the reality of it. As you said, they're going to, for what it's worth, I'm not representing Scump and I'm not representing a Hex in this. I'm, oh. I'm just, you know, right. So I, I would say that um, I think they're just, you know, I think they're just out to lunch and they kind of, this is just a, a bad PR statement for them. And and I don't think they actually even needed to say that. I think they could just say, this is ridiculous. This is, this opinion is yeah. without merit and for what it's worth. You know, yeah, I, maybe it is, you know, I think that there's, 
there's good arguments actually that they could probably make that there is no duty to deal here. I think that if we're being realistic with one another, like I think that the duty to deal probably does not extend to this. Um, and I don't yeah. need to go into the case law behind it. I do do that in the article. If you're interested in reading the footnotes, I put it in the footnotes if you feel like really, you know, pulling your hair out there. But <laughs> and we will <laughs> link his article below, guys, and we'll link yeah. the actual uh, lawsuit. I, I obviously don't claim any kind of specialty in law, so I want to just ask a layman question, which is when you do a case like this, is it the is it like the outcome doesn't have to be like all of this is the case, right? They can go like this point and counts, yeah. but the other one. So, for example, yeah. by the way, here's another thing people might not realize. Even even if this just meant that for content creators that have access to the game would be enormous in itself, by the way. Like the joke is, I'm not exaggerating. I would tomorrow start doing all the games on my channel. Do all, I'd have all review vods. I wouldn't have to worry about like even that alone could be enormous. So like, is it also the case that like they're going for everything there? They're going for the big brass bell, whatever the fuck. Yeah, you're just throwing everything scenario, against the wall here. <laughs> you, you just yeah. see what was the, like some of it could come through. Anyway, the first the filing parts, will right? always be super broad. Like right. I've, 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 obviously, I'm sat on a call with a lawyer. I've written about this all the time. And it's like what you watch over the course of covering law these esports lawsuits. Like, so I guess any lawsuit, you know, you watch them go, Ch -ch -ch, the complaints just get, Ch -ch -ch, they get more dialed in, more focused, you know, over it, that's if they don't get dismissed out of hand from the initial filing. But like, this isn't just one like allegation. There's like so much actually in this yeah. lawsuit. And while it's I actually... agree on the duty to deal uh, part of what you're talking about, I, I agree. I, I don't see how a company could ever be compelled based on this argumentation and based on the case law what i there are things in this which are like oh yeah that's kind of like what happened in overwatch i think you're i think you might be in trouble so yeah and that's actually a really good point to kind of transition off onto that and you know well i'll say this first i'll say with respect to um the things that could stick i do think that there is a potential that the second cause of action will stick i mean what we're essentially looking at there is a claim by Scump that the competitive balance tax in, uh, inhibited his ability to you know, generate more income than he could otherwise have done so. What he is saying is you put a salary cap in, you're not allowed to put a salary cap in because you can't make, you can't make use of a non-statutory labor exemption uh, to the antitrust laws. You do not have a union you negotiated against. This is a violation of antitrust, right? And so this is exactly what the Department of Justice went after Call of, uh, Overwatch League for mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. And they ended up, you know, settling that and they didn't go to court. But it would not surprise me if, uh, you know, a reviewing court looks at this and says, yeah, you know what? That was an antitrust violation. You did restrain that trade. They do have a claim to that. Now, yeah. there's different standards uh, that so are going for, to be applied. So for to what this, to explain what this was very quickly, is that because, again, you, you can look at, if you guys are curious about the unions, the player union stuff, go back and watch the episode of Summoning Insight where Thorne and I talked to Harris about the walkout of the players uh, from the the LCS Players Association last year, because we go in depth there. We're not going to do it again here. But basically, what happened with Overwatch League and Call of Duty League was Activision Blizzard imposed a secret luxury tax. So it was not a salary cap. It was more akin to what the NBA has, where if you go over a certain spending point on your team, your entire roster, then you pay a luxury tax that goes into the pockets of the league and the other owners of the league, right? And this is not legal unless there is a player's union to negotiate. So basically, the allegation within this lawsuit is that Scump, who is very famous, you guys probably know that, you know, once CDL went back on Twitch, his co-stream became bigger than the CDL stream. It's a Tarek and Valorant situation that they had. And so you can see that this guy's popularity was enormous because this was after he retired, right, that he was doing the co-streaming. And so it is fair to say that the violation that the DOJ has already investigated, the Department of Justice, U.S. Department of Justice came in, investigated this basically told Activision Blizzard to fuck off, and then they had to settle the lawsuit that was being brought by the U.S. government. And so and what's in this... what's interesting, Monty, just to add to that part about the settlement, because I've read the legal document for the settlement, and I don't know if this is normal in these cases, but the agreement, the things, they, the, the, things the court has asked them to agree to are really sealed true. to protect... Like Activision Blizzard's fe like feelings or like perception around <laughs> the company, like it it's not disclosed what they ha what they sort of have to do. Maybe you can speculate could be in there. What would you guess? 
Um, well, I, I really don't know. I mean, like, it doesn't, I don't think it had an explicit time frame. I think it's just moving forward. Um, so they, like, for example, like with the ESEA lawsuit, when they got caught turning their client illegally into a Bitcoin mining machine, they have to, they have to stay free of any violations of similar law for 10 years or, or the, or the deferred fines the court, uh, awarded will have to be paid but there's none of this level of detail in this settlement it's very weird i like i haven't really come across that before but the actual details are sealed and it and it, and it uses the language all the time that and in the agreement made with this court uh activision blizzard will follow that agreement through and it never actually says what the agreement is there's no filing on what the agreement is there's nothing written down so i i my assumption is they got absolutely fucking spanked that's what i think because otherwise, why would you not want it in there, you know? I think that, um, you know, I mean, they, they do stipulate, as you said, on a going forward basis that they're going to remove the competitive balance tax. I think mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, if I had to guess a large portion of that negotiation, what was going to be made public and what wasn't going to be made public for purposes of this. I mean, what we're essentially seeing here right now is you know, they didn't right. want to admit fault. Right. They don't admit fault that they that this is a violation of the antitrust laws in that settlement. They don't stipulate to that. They stipulate that we're going to stop doing this on an ongoing basis. They wouldn't stipulate to the fact that this was a violation because, one, they would invite all kinds of lawsuits just like the one that we're seeing right now. And so yeah, that's essentially point. what that's what that's what we're seeing right now. We're seeing basically part two of a person who was harmed by that, you know, pushing it and saying, OK, I, I should be making I should have made some money now. There's arguments that are going to be made. I it, it, just because it's important to know, just because um, we don't have a union doesn't mean it's per se illegal, right? There's tests that they that, that a reviewing court can make in assessing this. It just loses the the basically the, the blanket immunity it would otherwise be entitled to. Now they're going to conduct what is essentially going to be a test, to, or they're going to, they're going to, the reviewing court's going to look at that and they're going to say, should we look at this as per se illegal or should we conduct a test under the rule of reason under antitrust law? And then under the rule of reason, they basically say, was this salary cap that was imposed essentially reasonable to promote competitiveness, to you know promote the market, or was it just a blanket anti-competitive restriction? And the question is, do we get to the rule of reason? Are we on per se illegality? I mean, it's a whole separate complex analysis, which I'm not going to discuss, but essentially, you know, that is going to be a center of this lawsuit now that we are looking at here. They have lost that immunity, did not have a union, and now we have to do that second part of the test. By the yeah. way, this is also, to me, almost the perfect group of people to have this type of a lawsuit, because think about what they represent. They represent yeah. everything people would claim is, like, not just done by the game, it's done by the human involved. So, Scump was one of the GOAT players and did make millions when there was an open circuit. And if people don't know, by the way, a little bit of history, if you're not, if you're from, like, Counter-Strike or something, it was mainly in North America and a little bit in the UK, but they actually had a very, very healthy, um, M like, MLG-type circuit for Call of Duty back in the day. If you go back, when yeah. it was, like, Mr. X will commentate like 2017, 20 to 2020 or something. They had an amazing circuit where the top people, all the ones you can think of, Envious and, and fucking Optic and the Karma's guys, they were all making loads of money. And so players, these are the GOAT players we're talking about. Obviously, Hex was the one who did Optic, which was like the GOAT org, which as Richard says, basically every org now that thinks they're hot shit, like these LEC teams, like we've got like our own fan base. It's crazy. It's called the Blue Waltz, you fucking pleb derivative yeah. wankers. Like they invented that like half a decade or 10 years ago at this point in time. So they did that. And then through that, by the way, as well as being a team, it was probably the most influential content-related team ever. Absolutely. When the joke was, they even used to say, and that's another thing, by the way, all the league orgs copied from them, was when you join their team, you don't just play for them. You then become a content figure with vlogs and your own branding. And by the way, that branding allowed those players to also make millions of dollars each on the open circuit. Often they went to other teams and they had insane rivalries. It was like WWE almost. It was, I've always been very impressed with the way that was run. And then now, as you say, finally, You've got Scomp is a core streamer. And as Monty points out, in the modern day, if it was just the game that made all the views, then the main view channel would have all the views, wouldn't it? So why does a guy watching and going, shit, crazy, man? Look off camera. <laughs> oh, game two coming up late, boys. When we drop in, like, that wouldn't have any value. Well, some would argue, does it? But, you know, that wouldn't have any additional value to make me watch, would it? So I actually think if you were going to pick anyone to do this, I don't think there's any two people could simultaneously represent every aspect that isn't just the game, essentially. It's actually brilliant. 
yeah, I, I actually completely agree. They, they are um, they are great plaintiffs, and and Scump, particularly on the second cause of action, really has a good claim because he's you know the second best player to ever. I mean, I mean, he's one of the best players to ever play Call of Duty, right? And obviously, his wages would have been restrained if there's a, a you know you take it at face value that this had the effect of disincentivizing people to go spend. So that is actually, I think, a very good claim that actually could survive this. Um, and and I, I think that it's interesting that it's finally being brought. I think that the, the third and fourth ones, you know, again, just kind of going back to the duty to deal, that's kind of what you kind of just talked about is a little bit about what they're kind of alleging too, because they're basically saying, listen, we had a very prosperous industry prior to 2019, 2020, you know, before we started this Call of Duty League. We had, you know, an open circuit. We had MLG doing stuff. Like you guys basically ruined this entire industry because you bought out MLG and then you basically turned into a closed league with no one able to come. And now they actually say this is some point in the lawsuit. You've got 12 employees left and you've bankrupted every single team. And no one, you know, is able to make money on this anymore. And we've all lost out because of you guys. So one, pay us money and two, allow us to go back to what we had. And that actual aspect of it, you know, on the duty to deal argument is actually pretty interesting because the most recent Supreme Court take on the duty to deal actually asks whether or not there was a prior existence of, you know, engaging in this kind of dealing, which was then taken away Mm -hmm. from them. So have they done it in the past? And the fact that they actually did have licenses or a licensing scheme in the past is actually a buck in their favor in this kind of an argument. So Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting. And, and, if I could just like, you know, provide a very high level of kind of the, the context in which this would normally come up, um, not to get too legalistic, but like imagine you have, and this is actually interestingly enough too, they filed in the Ninth Circuit and the Ninth Circuit has the most plaintiff favorable uh, laws on this, on this issue, right? And one Ninth Circuit case basically dealt with a Kodak machine, right? And you had Kodak re- refusing to sell parts to independent service people who were basically just like, you know, they would service the machine in the event that it was broken, right? Kodak was was trying to essentially say, we're not gonna sell parts to these people. We're not gonna, we're not gonna do that. We're going to require you to use us for maintenance, right? Mm. And the point there was like, no, you, you can't do that. That's anti-competitive, even though you happen to own those parts and you own the IP associated with that. So the, the Ninth Circuit actually came down in favor of the independent service people in that point saying they, they did actually have to sell them. They did have a duty to deal. And so that it, it is interesting to kind of mention here that, that that is kind of similar to what we're looking at right here. There was an existence of a licensing scheme before that, and now um, it was a, a great industry, and now they kind of swooped it all away, and it's horrible. By the way, I would even say to that point, by the way, that's if, uh, this is just a random thing I'll throw out there. When it comes to this sort of type of companies, I don't even like some of the people who probably would be the plaintiffs in future cases. But if you ever want anyone as an expert witness, hit me up, I'll do it for free. Don't fucking worry about it, right? Because one of the <laughs> things I also do think is, this ties into a bigger topic that on this show we have mentioned many, many, many times, which is the most annoying thing about esports is people who have only been around four years think like, this is the zenith. It could only ever have gone this way. And now you have to just hope it like goes back and recapitulate and just goes higher next time. They don't know there was actually a period, almost exactly as we're talking about the time frame here, where you could actually have been a functional business. There were functional businesses. Yeah. People like Cloud9 or SK Gip, they were real businesses, guys, that could actually pay people very healthy wages and run in the top leagues of the world, which were open circuits at the time. And the problem you have is this, is you essentially had, like I would imagine in a lot of sports cases, a lot of these types of battles, which would happen eventually anyway, would be more like, hey, I'm making like some good money, but I like, I'm owed more of the cut, you know, I need more of the big money. No, no, this is one where now you've almost like baited people into then taking a functional business, attaching like, essentially, it's like you've taken their boat and just poked loads of holes in it, so it's sinking. And then after that, now they're like, well, you basically baited me into ruining my whole business because the problem if you're a Cloud9 or an Optic and you come from an iconic game is you might today be a functional business that's at the top of that industry, but if they make a franchise league and because they have a monopoly and they can say only the 10 teams in the franchise league are the top Tier, you are basically at that point you have two choices because there's no functional business at that time had like 20 million sitting in the bank so you had to go and get an investor and get him to invest so you could buy into this franchise league and what did you do that off you didn't do that based on just well it's their right to do no no you did that because they put out documents like the morgan stanley report that told you all oh, the projections are excellent all oh, the financial wizards are telling us this all oh, the numbers are going up look this is going to be amazing and so basically you told someone essentially like who had essentially a sort of very 
highly successful mom and pop store almost become franchised in my big company. We're all going to make millions together. And then you lose loads. And as we've pointed out many times in the past one, for stuff like Overwatch League, it could have been way worse. Like if there hadn't have actually been the pandemic, there's a world where like you would have bankrupted all the orgs in like one or two years with the homestand. So I actually think as well, this is a way, like the scope of the case, like that, you, you could, if you want to take like the Blizzard approach of being sort of like, now, now, this has really hurt my feelings. I tell you what, mate, you could get a lot of fucking emotional people on the stand to talk about this, who essentially <laughs> did have like a real business and a future and an industry and the whole thing fucking tanked because of a bunch well, of greedy asshole game devs. It, it's also that, um, you know, one of, to your point, Thorin, one of the allegations within this lawsuit yeah. is that basically, exactly that. You know, it, it, we all, we all, it's exactly that. And it, 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 we have to go back to the history of Optic as well, to a certain degree, because we have to remember that Optic, as it originally existed in the MLG circuit. Now, when Call of Duty franchising happened, like the ownership of the Optic brand is like bounced around a number of times now. So it was like Hector's, and then it was Infinite. 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 Infinite, then what? Yeah, with the... Infinite, then Immortals, wasn't Infinite. it? Yeah, yeah. Infinite, um, then Immortals. So Immortals ended up buying the Optic brand. You know, the Immortals LA Valiant team. And then they were the LA Optic for a while. And then they weren't the LA Optic anymore. And what a fact. And then yeah, they, Hector, then Hector brought it, brought it back. back from them. And then he owned it, but he couldn't get into CDL with the Optic brand. And so one of the allegations he makes is that he was forced to sell 92.5% of the brand to the com the parent company of Envy for $20 million. Yeah. And so he was basically, I mean, I, 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 I wonder what you think about this, Harris, because it seems like kind of bullshit because he like doesn't have to own a CDL team and he presented as if he was coerced into selling 92.5% of his team in order to enter CDL. But there's the other opposite argument is that Optic as a brand has no value unless it is a professional Call of Duty team. What do you think about this? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. And, and I think it's really, you know, it's good that you, you kind of mentioned that because that's exactly what I was going to respond to Thorn with. Well, actually, they're doing that. That's exactly one of their allegations is that you made us partner with these people and we didn't want to do that, right? So this is known as the customer restriction in antitrust law, right? And a customer restriction um, is not always going to be per se uh, illegal it might be subject to you know it, it could be rationally justified basically saying like okay we're gonna we're only gonna allow you to do business with these people right so f I, i'd say the first thing i'm gonna do in, in this kind of analysis is i have to assume that there was actually a customer restriction like we have to take it at face, face value like yeah like we we weren't going to sell this slot to you hector unless you're going to be with those people and then you kind of have to like walk that backwards a little bit and kind of say okay is that valid under antitrust law Right, because now we're in, we're in antitrust law at this point, and so it's like, okay, well, per se, it's not, you know, I, I think people would, and, and this is kind of where it gets complicated, right? You essentially have that being promulgated by a licensing agreement that is being directed by the license holder. So through a licensing agreement, we then put down to the people underneath them, this is, you know, the restrictions that you're going to have in this team participation agreement. You can only sell to people that we approve to, right? If alleged, as as, as the case, right? Then that's that's a hard, that's a customer restriction that can actually be justified in certain in certain instances under the rule of reason. I think that's exactly what Activision Blizzard would argue in that instance. So it's not clear to me that that's necessarily a problem. You know, I think that Activision Blizzard's argument is likely to be like, listen, guys, like we are interested in making our IP as successful as possible. And that means that we are yeah. interested in making the Call of Duty League as successful as possible. And that means that we get to choose who is going to you know, receive a license to that league, which means that like, sorry, Hector, but like we didn't want you. We wanted you and Robert Kraft or we wanted you and Scott Malkin, the owner of the New York Islanders, like go get a billionaire because you can put a ton of money in and not have to worry about it. Like we want to build stadiums. You're not building a stadium. And that's unfortunate. But like the question goes back to can they can they do that by virtue of and, and, and I think and not to kind of bring it back, but going I, I think. There's really two interesting angles here. We've touched on one of them. One of them is antitrust. Do they have the right to monopolize? Do they have the right to, is there a duty to deal? That's interesting because that could open up the circuit too. But one other interesting area is if after there's a response from Activision basically saying, hey, look, guys, we, have, we own the IP. Like we own all derivatives that could come out of this IP. We own the public performance right. If that gets challenged, if that gets challenged, that would lead to a reworking of copyright understanding. So it depends how how fucking flame on Hex and Scump want to go here. Like they could just be like, all right, like here's here's a mash. Like I'm throwing everything out here, guys. Like let's go. We're gonna burn the whole fucking place down, right? Like they could do that, and they could basically go after the copyright too if they want to. And then you're gonna have people 
who have basically commented saying, well, we don't think you should have the derivative rights, uh, all derivative rights to that. Because, you know, in 1983, when we were talking about this game, you guys ever seen the movie Big? Out of curiosity, yes, with Tom, yeah, Hanks. Tom Hanks, yeah. There's like a a scene in that where they're showing a video game, like it's like a, a 1980s video game, and it's like it, it's like you're talking to this wizard, and he's like, go down this path, and you push a button, and you like go down that path, and it's like a, a story showing that path. Yeah, yeah. That was the kind of idea they had for video games in the 1980s. They weren't talking about like massively, you know, massive games like World of Warcraft, where the whole world is your oyster. Like that didn't exist. I mean, so like. Th you, you know, th there's also the things like, uh, to your point, the complexity of video games and what you said the original ruling was is that they owned all the instances of the video game because they could have foreseen all of the results. I don't think you can take a complex five versus five esport or even StarCraft, for example, and imagine every single result that a pro player could have within one of those games, right? right. Because there's an in it's basically it's gone from a finite number of outcomes to effectively infinite complexity. Look at a game like Baldur's Gate 3, right? You, you can't say that Larian could have, uh, you know, foretold every outcome of player actions within that game. Well, I mean, but right. also cru crucially, the, the, the now, the, 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 there's no conceptualization about broadcasting gameplay at that moment in time. You wouldn't, you, right. you know what I mean? So the, the idea that like everybody these days is their own p potentially like broadcasting studio and that there would be, you know, essentially what back then would have been like, ham radio or pirate radio but it's for everyone and it's not even on tv it's not on cable it can't be stopped <laughs> it, you know as long as i've got a computer i can do it uh and and somebody can connect and watch it there's no conceptualization about that in the 80s either so the 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 bro the parameters of the copyright uh, you know it, it needs to be revisited frankly it's like it's, i've said yeah. i've said it so much like it, it conceptually right so first of all it's hard enough to get boomers in politics to fucking understand these things like every time there's a tech hearing in the senate i fucking cringe as i watch some <laughs> guy who, he's not even that old like he's 58 and he's asking like the guy from facebook why why can't i download my twitter dms and it's like oh my god stop <laughs> you're fucking killing me with this guys and they don't get it so you've got boomers in politics but then the people that understand this in law there's no like there's no benefit to themselves to just take it upon themselves to like challenge these, you know, the legislative framework that's in place, the legal framework that's in place. It has to come through cases. And so far, every major case that could change the problems we've got with esports around copyright, the Tifu case, all of this stuff, it always gets settled. And we're stuck yep. with this bullshit from the 80s and nothing moves forward. And there has to be a lawsuit that breaks that trend. Because relatively speaking, we're in the fucking Stone Age legally to where esports and gaming and all of that media streaming, where we're actually existing. And I'll actually I have say, a question. Oh, sorry, I was going to ask you a question quickly, Harris, which goes like this: Go, go for it. Is go it for it. is it just the case that like because they're the ones starting this and they're, and also they're publicising it and we're doing a show now and you've written the art console, so you're getting the word out there that like Hex and, and Scott, who everyone knows in esports, are doing this. Like logically, to me, the end goal, no matter which side we come down on, it surely isn't just Activision Blizzard and Hex and Scott. Like surely, eventually, like on the other side, it's like Activision Blizzard, Riot Games, like Valve, every company you can imagine, Ubisoft, and then on this side. It's like Hector's gone, Jack Etienne, fucking Reggie from TS. Shouldn't it eventually be sort of like both sides put together the war chests and have like a massive war? It's interesting that you say that. And I'll, I'll kind of take it take it one way. I'll, I'll say, I don't know. I mean, like, I, I think I mentioned this at some point, but like, and if not, I'll mention it right now. Like the teams are actually listed as potential defendants in this case. Yes. Right, right. Like, okay. which they was are... misreported by all the Jake Lucky clout goblins on fucking Twitter because <laughs> nothing is fucking works properly in esports of course it was all the teams are suing activision blizzard just read just one time just fucking read something that you tweet about please anyway sorry go on Harris. it's yeah, just yeah, that meme of happy. like hey those kids in that class would be really upset if they could read that's like, he is just <laughs> that meme though that's the problem, isn't it? yeah i mean i i think it's, it's just to kind of read um you know not to not to bore anyone but it's to read very quick, quickly from the cause you know because i think it's important to yeah. kind of have context it says the it alleges the league office and each of the admitted teams through their respective owners, officers, directors, members, affiliates, parents, and or agents participated as co-conspirators. So they're, they're basically saying like, 
we reserve the right to add these guys because they were part of this, you know, conspiracy to restrain trade. And so I think well, that I, I think I think that this is because just very quickly, Harris, because they view Optic as a brand, as a threat to right, their so own brands that they're absolutely. developing within the league, because Optic, if you guys don't know, Optic was the one that was taking, you know, Optic and FaZe were the big teams in Call of Duty. And so by excluding Optic, you actually potentially divide their fans amongst the new franchises uh, that were uh, up and coming within the league. So Optic's return is a threat to the other teams for losing like 90 percent of their fan base. Yeah, Continue. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I mean, all I would say, so I don't know that I would see like Jack, you know, getting involved in this. I, I think that, you know, there's actually I, I have to be very careful, too, with what I say because of the potential for you know potential clients of mine to be invited, you know, included in this. So but I, I do think that at a broader level, you're talking about just interests. And I think it's absolutely the case that the downstream of the you know from the market, the top of the market, the IP holder has been you know brutally savaged by, you know, a god who is not kind, and that's kind of one way to put it, right? <laughs> and and um, Some and of I us think have already a... been brutally savaged by this god that was not kind, Harris. I think yeah. I think everybody here is in that mode. <laughs> the joke is, this is where me saying that joke tweets it. I have esports. I'll just end up getting sued for it all in the end. Like I'll just be the one else. Yeah. Be like, <laughs> like a two billion dollar fucking massive case on my ass. I'll never be able to play it off with that. So backfired on me finally. It's tweet. They got me in the end, like porn or something. <laughs> oh man uh no so all so all i would just say is like you know there's actually been movement there and and you know one of my you know my colleagues his name is ryan fairchild actually uh we we work at the esports bar association where we kind of just you know we try to put out academic articles and that's kind of what we just do um because we like to talk about this kind of stuff he actually argues that um the public performance right which is granted by section 106 of the copyright act you know the the, the copyright holders are to publicly perform that maybe should be revisited and so i guess the existing case law is like back in the 1980s again someone was playing in an arcade some copyrighted game and you know they sued over that and they're like well you don't have the right to, to play that copyrighted game the reason is because and this is the most ridiculous distinction in the entire world by the way because the game uses audio visual images and those are are entitled to a different like you see the image of the thing right that is different than if we were to play a board game in public there is no public performance right to a board game but there is to a video game and that's actually a distinction that is currently made under existing copyright law because one uses audio visual images the other does the the, the the new case on this is actually called allen and Alan actually calls for – and so Ryan's argument is basically we should revisit the public performance right with respect to the copyrighted games because it's not being applied that way in board games. And functionally, they're the same fucking thing. So yeah. who really cares, right? And so I, I do think that there is there are several arguments that can be made attacking the actual copyright of this. But can I you would imagine just kind of... if that wasn't there as well, like what like what the face of streaming would look like? Like think about all the Dungeons & Dragons streamers like and shit like that. You know what I mean? Like, if, if there weren't, like, if you didn't have the right to do that shit, like, it would just be, you know. So I, I, I totally agree. I mean, it makes sense. What, what really is the difference between a board game and a video game? Ultimately, than the medium yeah. in which you engage with it, right? Right. And so I think that it's, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. And I think that, um, at least with respect to public performance rights, I think that 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 is something that is 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 ripe for challenge right now as well. And I think that we we'll, we could see that if if Hexens come, just go. We're throwing the you know we're we're going in. We're just going in. We're going ham. Like we don't give a shit anymore. Like that's that could happen. So I think that that is um that is definitely a just uh, a potentially interesting area as well in copyright. And I think that we'll kind of see all these things kind of come into play at some at some point too when when you're essentially just going to see like you know a, a motion to dismiss which is going to come from activision blizzard and then they're going to challenge that and yeah. we'll kind of just we'll see how that plays out yeah can i ask a can i can i ask a question about because while we're just on this particular aspect of the lawsuit which is again just to recap for the listeners um that heck the, the claim hector is making is that he was essentially forced to partner with someone he wouldn't have ordinarily done so in order to be able to be in this league and that he felt he had to do that for the good of his business because what is optic if it's not competing in call of duty um there's an aspect to this that first of all they frame it as coercion um 
uh, you know, so first of all, it was he had to go through a series of hoops. You know, you've got to prove you've got three million dollars in capital. He did that. Then they said, oh, you've got to get a 10 million line of credit. And then he, he did that. And then they said, well, actually, none of that matters. Uh, uh, and then th there's a line where he says um, on a conference call, one Activision yeah. executive explicitly told Rodriguez that he was not the type of owner Activision wanted for the league. Activision made clear to Rodriguez that he would be required to partner, and that's in air quotes, uh, with billionaire investors who, also in quotes, looked like Activision's ideal or leave the professional Call of Duty market altogether. As a result of this threat, Rodriguez was forced to partner with investors that met Activision's approval. I'm super interested about that part because obviously, as you know, when you file something legally, you 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 can even you you when you intimate something, it's very deliberate. You, you, yeah. you know, it wouldn't be there if you weren't trying to say something. And I read that as them saying, you know, Hector, Mexican heritage. There's like a racial component to it. Yeah, there's there. definitely a I, racial animus that's kind of being, you know, intimated there. Yeah. I think you're absolutely right. Again, it comes back. I mean, listen, I, I I have a hard time believing that there would be, you know, if if and again, I I I wasn't in the conference room, so I'm not going to opine on whether that happened or not. But he's obviously inserting it, and so if there is an allegation of of some sort of, you know, racism there, I think what you need to kind of do is you kind of need to just you need to say like. That's not going to survive a rule of reason test. You can't, you can't, I don't think you can, you can discriminate on the basis of race and in including people into your league. That's, that's bullshit, frankly. Um, now, the broader question of like, well, can we require you to be with a billionaire? Like, because those are the kinds of people that are going to invest capital. I think that's open for discussion. Like, that's, I don't actually think that's, they can't, oh, it's not always going to be unreasonable to say we want like, you know, these kinds of billions. It is unreasonable to say, you know, you have to have a bunch of old white guys because, that's the kind of look we're looking to project. That that is unreasonable, and I don't think that mm. that would work. And um, you know, if I can just really quickly, because uh, I you know I was I was talking before I, I kind of forgot where I was going with this, but I think that it's it's really important. You know, on the on the topic of copyright, it's really important to note because we were talking about like you know the history of all this stuff. I was reading a filing called BMI versus CBS, and for those those of you that don't know, BMI is basically a public performance uh, organization. It licenses the public performance rights to compositions. Uh, you know, to repertoire, it has a repertoire. So it basically says we have all of these song compositions, and if you you know you want a blanket license to all of them, just come pay us, right? Anyway, back in the 1970s, when this case was being discussed, what actually happened was the, there was a filing that was made by um, by BMI because there, there was an allegation that their conduct of blanket licensing this and then price fixing on what those licenses was going to be because they controlled all the copyrights to these these songs. That was going that that was anti-competitive and violative of the antitrust mm. act right and so it's interesting to note because the attorney who was representing bmi at this time said markets cannot emerge that there was he tried to distinguish patent law from copyright law because patent law deals with inventions and markets that emerge around an invention like the fucking i don't know chair or television or some shit right like whatever it is but markets can't emerge around copyrights because when copyright was created, in, in it's in the fucking constitution, right? Like in the 1780s, when it was created, it was conceived as artistic work. This is, we're talking about literary work. We're talking about music. We're talking about choreography. We're talking about this kind of shit. We're not talking about markets emerging around that. So the the plaintiffs, uh, the attorney for for BMI actually said, well, markets don't emerge around copyright law. So like. Your misuse argument is bullshit. Like, there's no markets that emerge around copyright law. It's interesting because copyright law was not intended to kind of have this entire market yeah. that we have seen it spawn around video games now. That was not the original conception. So I thought it was very interesting to, because where this area of intersection between IP rights and antitrust typically takes place is in the field of patents because markets do emerge in patents. But this is relatively new and it's nuanced and it's it's novel because it doesn't typically happen in copyrights historically, but because of video games and kind of their application in copyright law, this really, really broad application, it's bringing to the front this novel kind of case. And so I, I, I thought it was important to kind of mention that, um, not to go on too much of a tangent. Know.
No, no, no. That's super interesting, actually. Yeah. By the way, one thing I've always found interesting about this topic is it's actually a rare case. I mean, obviously, when we're getting into all the minutiae here, people might get a bit lost. But Sorry. I think it's one of the rare cases in terms of a big lawsuit where people can understand the central crux quite simply. I mean, you can yep. give a million analogies for it. Like, the concept is, even if you made a pen, if I write a novel with it, you don't own the copyright to my novel. Right. Like, everyone gets that. So the obvious example, the best example ever now is obviously League of Legends, isn't it? Like, fake is the goat like do we watch because it's rise being played or do we watch because faker's playing rise i would argue we watch for faker's artistry and what he does with the champion and even i'd even say by the way hit me up faker if you want me in court i'd even say certain other people could not do what faker does in fact i'd even say the person who made rise could not play the way faker did so i would even say that's a great <laughs> argument as to why he is doing something unique and the reason why that is such a massive deal is that doesn't even just affect the people who do the the game dev and the ip rights like if you think about it, that goes further of things like actually why am i why is someone allowed to broadcast on Twitch Faker's game, but without like, like having him contracted somehow to them directly and getting a profit share. So this again, these are this is why this topic, guys. Oh, even if this one just seems like it's about Call of Duty, and you might come from League of Legends or StarCraft or Valorant or CS. The whole point is, if this happens, the precedent could be enormous. And this is this is the can of worms just starting to get opened. And if it gets opened, the whole thing could every aspect of the industry could tip upside down. And so I, I would also just say, you know. You mentioned the faker thing. I think it's really, imp and you mentioned this earlier, but we didn't go too much into it. I do actually think it's important to talk about spectate faker. And, you know, I've mm. been around, I, I remember that, but basically what happened was, at least as I recollect it, faker signed a contract with, I think it was a Zubu back in it the day. It was a Zubu, yes. It was, yes. It was like a million dollar contract to exclusively yep. stream on a Zubu, right? And then basically what you had was, um, spectate faker who's just some random like some some random guy he goes on like op.gg and he clicks on the spectate button and then he shows that on twitch right and then azubu's yeah. like well wait a second we have the exclusive right to this twitch you're infringing our copyright and then there's a question at that point which is implicit and it's hidden but it's well, wait a second who owns that copyright Yes. Who owns that? Does did Faker have the right to give to Azubu well, in the first place? Riot Games. Another little detail. And I, I remember covered this yeah. extensively. Another little detail is Riot Games told Azubu to DMCA the stream, hmm. which implies Azubu have the copy down. Yeah. yeah, or the, yeah, which is interesting because Riot didn't, and they, it probably way, didn't understand I'd, itself. <laughs> no, no, yeah. there's another thing I think of immediately. I'd love to see if that ever comes up in one of these cases in the future that you essentially said that someone else had the rights and they should DMC yeah, other things, exactly. not yourself. Yeah. Why weren't you doing it? And also, people don't know just to keep bit get a bit of levity. The actual punchline of all of that is idiots like Mark Merrill got involved. They started popping off publicly and said stupid shit like that someone was cyber stalking Faker by yeah, through a different thing watching a game that he was already <laughs> selling to be seen by anyone who could open a frit. Like, it was actually probably one of the maddest mischaracterizations I've ever seen, and that was coming from Aquarius. Well, the other, the other punchline, Duncan, was they had their own channel called Timo Dies, yes. which yeah, was right. other people's gameplay that <laughs> yes. they were streaming on Twitch without their permission or knowledge. <laughs> so, well, well, yeah, also, nice, they were... Nice it, Riot, well done. Nice. The only reason that this was possible is because they gave API access to OPGG yeah. and other sites so that anybody could spectate anybody in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Completely, it, completely it, absurd. It, it is absurd. And I, it, it just highlights kind of the mess. And I, and I think that, you know, I, I honestly think that like <laughs> some of these developers might in, in retrospect, like, a, you know, a couple of years ago, they'd be like, well, we have that right. Like, we're very surprised we have that right. You're just going to give that to us. Like, what yeah. the hell? We don't deserve these rights. No one else gets these rights. Like, what are we doing? And they control the entire downstream market. And so, you know, it, at least with respect to this case, uh, with respect to what could potentially happen, yeah, I do think that this has the potential to really shake some things up. I think if nothing else, um, and I, I think this is actually a really interesting point that we, we haven't really talked about yet. You know, you said that they're incentivized, you know, you, no, you didn't say that, I'm sorry. You said that like most of these times, these things kind of just settle. I actually don't think that they are incentivized to settle right now because if they just go settle, then they're just inviting someone else to go do the same thing and we're going to milk that cash cow. They're not just going to, you know, we don't, they, but, they don't but want imagine to. Imagine a world, imagine a world where, right, put it this way if you had to assess, give Hector 20 million as a settlement 
or potentially lose the right to be this Sauron-esque Dark Lord controlling all of oh, your yeah. copyright across all of the industry. I mean, if at any point there was a genuine fear that could happen, or even if the can of worms were just going to be opened and they were going to say, well, actually, you know, listen, it's reasonable that you choose who you do business with, but, you know, we're actually, when it comes to broadcasting it, we're going to reassess. And did it, all of a sudden... You know, you might be losing way more than if you did pay off everybody. I mean, it's like I said with the Overwatch League. I'm utterly convinced that when those uh, uh, team, when they uh, contracted Sheridan's, the team owners said, all swore up and down to me, we were never going to sue uh, Blizzard. We were just using that law firm that specializes in suing people over tech disputes. We were just, it was just for communication purposes. That's what they all told me. I'm pretty convinced they went and said, we're all on the same page here. You you sold us a bill of goods. We're going to sue the shit out of you. Make it right. And the making it right was the $6 million to fuck off me. I think that's like, you, you know, so imagine a world where, uh, let's say, for example, Hector's able to win over a few of these team owners that could be named as co-conspirators or whatever. And they go, okay, yeah, we'll come, we'll come in. We agree. We're going to champion what you're doing. And then suddenly it's a big war like Duncan's envisioning, you know, and, and maybe you do just settle. I mean, personally, and again, I'm obviously not a lawyer. You know better than me. When I saw this lawsuit, I said, that's got settlement written all over it. Not just because of the contents, not just because of the length, because this lawsuit is running for years if it does go to the bitter end, but also timing. Microsoft have just took over Activision Blizzard. They've got rid of a lot of the Kotick cronies. They've started installing their own management. We've had mass layoffs. It's about as close to a clean start as you're going to get for a company, Activision in this case, which has tarnished its reputation Rich, ridiculously over the last two years. Let me ask you a question, yeah. though. Right? Let's say that they settled. The, let's say they settled with Scump, and they, they pay him some money off. Right? What's to stop Clayster from ma making an allegation that there was yeah, competitive the problem. tax or that strange strange is, or you know, you know what's the, profit from the know, Overwatch League? I mean, it's just like it keeps, well, like, no, keeps going. Sure. Them, uh, fears, uh, anyone, but they're just going to keep coming not. at them, and they're going to make the same allegations. And so I think that uh, you know, you kind of have unlocked something here, and it's a little bit mm. deeper. There, there is something that is like okay, like we have a choice to make right now. Like, what are we going to do about the, the the floodgates, which could be opened? If we just allow, but this that's to, also we... true. That's also true in the Tifu case. Uh, you know, t t why didn't more people signed into what are ostensibly talent agency agreements? Why didn't more like, why people didn't come Shroud forward? Do after it? Why didn't Ninja yeah, do why... it? Yeah, everyone could yeah. have got it right. Right. So, you so have I mean, that, that have, the thing I, about, I mean, honestly, the answer is because people haven't read that that law. That's actually right. yeah, 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 honest, yeah. I have, but you know, I, did, yeah, I can, can tell you, yeah, I read the complete yeah. like talent agency act of California yes. or whatever. It was will, not, listen, not fun. I will say, I have to always shade in like a one percent chance. Like he knows, like his life one day might be a movie, and he was giving me material for the script, which I would write. Obviously, Gonzo, the esports story. After he dies in like a John Belushi style eight ball, you know, in a hotel room somewhere, like. You, <laughs> The proper way to go out. You know? I, I did. I did once go to Rich's house in Vegas when he was working on that like WSOE, and then I did sit down and to watch like an NFL game or something. And then I was like, "What's that?" And there was like a massive thing of like ring binder with all like papers. And he was like, "Oh, it's just like uh, like California labor law." So like, I'm sort of like halfway through, like, "What the fuck are you talking about?" Like, I know he's just reading it for fun at the time. He didn't have anything yeah. to do with it. Like, he just wanted to know the case. But I was going to actually yeah. ask a question about the parameters because if we're talking like the scale of where this could go, the other reason I also wonder if like you might eventually have to settle or if they go super on the other side is is this not if i think of some of the most famous ever antitrust type suits here like microsoft said can't you just drag this out over years and years and years though and make the costs like incredibly prohibitive to the plaintiff would that not be the case harris yeah i mean that is that's a strategy right like i think that that's that's obviously a strategy they're not if they want to fight this they, they could just you know file as many things as they potentially want to and they could go this could go on for years i mean we're not going to really I, I don't think that we're going to get an answer to this anytime soon i no, just no, think that exactly it, i just want people to know it's not going to be like in a year we're going to find out oh yeah it's all cool everything's no. free now guys like no like this if like the whole point like i'm saying is if it goes to the scale it could this could be like 10 years or something right to get it all Bro, done through to get all the to put it broken. in context right what's going on right now is the sumail versus evil genius's jury trial. Well, oh, that was from so years think, ago, yeah. That think about how long ago. it's been. Yes. Well, that was like three <laughs> or four years ago. Since was on yeah. EG, yeah, yeah. So these things definitely take time if you want to no. ride it out to and, the and end. And I would also, yeah. I also say, like, given the potential... So, yeah, yeah again, I have to, I'm trying to walk the line between being too legal <laughs> and not, you know, I think that it's important to kind of, just kind of wrap our heads around that 
it's not just about esports. It is about esports. There's a lot that can happen in esports, but this is way broader ramifications on a legal scale. We are now talking about duty to deal, whether that is applicable to copyright. Then there's also something else, and I haven't even talked about this yet. Like the section one of the Sherman Antitrust Act deals with a you know illegal res- or uh, unreasonable restraints on trade that are basically put into an agreement, right? So we have people agreeing that they're going to unreasonably restrain trade, right? And I think an argument often is in patent law that Hey guys, like I own the exclusive rights. I have the monopoly on patent stuff. If I want to restrain trade and I give my right to somebody else or say, like, I'm going to tell this person they could sell my product, but they could only do it at that price. We're going to price fix it. Like that happens sometimes in licensing agreements. I'll tell you, I'll license this to you, but it has to be sold at that price, right? That happens, right? So there's a question as to what, where that intersection is with between copyright and between um, antitrust law there too, because they're basically going to say, well, we own the copyright here. You can't play this without us anyway, and therefore we can put up license terms, whatever we want to do with our license terms. You can't restrict us. And the, 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 the kind of diversion from that is that one, all the cases that kind of deal with that deal with it in the context of patent law, not really copyright. Two, the Supreme Court itself has discussed this issue, and there is no consensus right now on the Supreme Court as to whether or not a patent, you know, the the antitrust analysis begins after we've assessed the scope of the patent law, or it it, it it comes in tandem with it. In other words, do we balance antitrust with patent law, or do we just say patent law then antitrust? There's not really a good understanding of this at the court. They've been fighting over this issue for about a hundred years, actually, and so it's novel because we're talking about it first in the context of copyright, but two, we're looking at a court which is actually more conservative than the last time they addressed this issue. So it's possible they might go back to where they used to say and say, no, we're just going to look at patent law and then then we do antitrust. So you know, it's it's you know obviously we're talking about copyright here, but that is so there's a lot of nuance on this. This has a massive ramification if it were to go. You know, to copyright and antitrust generally. So we're not just talking about it from an esports perspective. This thing could literally, you know, if it were ever to go, it could go all the way. If it, if depending on how you know it, it goes and how far they want to go with it. So it actually has broader legal ramifications too. I, I would really underscore that. By the way, I just like the idea because I will say, obviously, he isn't on the actual case here, guys. As he said, he just wrote an article about it. But because he represents a bunch of like teams in esports, so there's a there's a world where he might one day be involved in a case like this. So I will say, actually, I'll give him props for coming on this show because unfortunately, I do envision a world where you know someone wheels out like a sort of Kennedy type scenario when they were Jim Garrick or whatever, like you, Garrison. You bring out like a fucking thing and they pr- bring like the projector out and they start rolling this show. And they're like, did you not just say on this show on the you know the tw- 18th or whatever? Like uh, you know, so it's, get you. you you know what to do, but you've got to stay safe. Stay safe. I, already, I gotta already, stay. already have yeah. my YouTube videos in that as well, like in a in lawsuits. <laughs> Uh, oh, I'd love yeah. to have a video for some context ever in a lawsuit short that was just like, and how's it today, dickheads? Like, just like, I want that so much. I'll fix it in there even if it's not even necessary for the case. Do it. Uh, uh, I, I don't care. If they want to come after me, let them come after me. I've, I've had plenty of <laughs> spats. With one, one thing I was very surprised by uh, was uh, it, it, it seems to me they were arguing that the initial terms were unconscionable, but they stayed, they stopped uh, short of saying that explicitly. I don't think the word unconscionable appears in the document. It didn't leap off the page to me. But obviously, there's a segment where they outline what you had to agree to to be in the Call of Duty League, which is $27.5 million buy-in, which, I mean, that's staggering on its face. But yeah. I, we've beaten that horse to death, so it's whatever. Um, when uh, Rutgers, the... you're so silly. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, well, sure. See, now, if, the bad thing is, it just seems so mental, doesn't it? But at the time, yeah. believe it or not, how much money uh, people were I just know. like, well, maybe that's where it's going now. But now it just I seems bonkers, doesn't it? I, it does seem I, I wasn't. <laughs> 50% of all the revenue off the top, uh, then it, you also had to acquiesce. You couldn't have a sponsor that, they, that Activision ruled clashed with the league sponsor. But I also think there was a part of this, and I can't remember if this is something I was told or if it's in the lawsuit. But um, you also, if you got a sponsor the league liked the look of, they you you were obliged to tell them about it and let them have talks with them. Yeah. So. Yeah, that to me immediately, like, I, again, I've, I've never seen it with an org before. 
but I've covered a lot of these lawsuits and they usually get filed in California. And so obviously, as you, again, I don't need to tell you this, that in California, they're very plaintiff friendly, particularly around issues of unconscionability. If, you know, and, and I have seen a lot of, you know, unconscionability arguments made about unfair contracts of that nature where one party wields so much disproportionate power and stands to benefit in such a disproportionate way compared to the other party that in California they, they, they usually come down on the side of the plaintiff who's filing. So I was just wondering about that because it doesn't seem like they're even interested in kind of going for that angle but I, I, I feel based on the cases I've covered in the past that might be an, another W potentially. So I, I don't think that they're going for that angle. Um, they're not, yeah. there's no prayer for relief in, in any kind of, you know, um, looking for injunctions basically to get out of these kinds of contracts. And I would also note that the plaintiffs in this case are Hector and Scump. It's not, you know, the, the entities that are, they're party to that contract. So mm. I think that's kind of a, a thing that we should kind of distinguish. I think they raise these issues as a way of saying, look at the antitrust, the monopoly that they are asserting, look at the restraints on trade that they are asserting or that they are requiring downstream, you know, of all these teams they own the ip sure but then they're saying you got to do that 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 and that that's fucking ridiculous it's, it's it's unreasonable restraining our trade it's unreasonably restraining mm. our trade you can't do that that's bullshit and so that's kind of why they list all these things out you know i unfortunately i can't talk about kind of what is in that team p the, the team participation sure. I, I helped negotiate it but you know i i would say that i think you could kind of understand how these dynamics typically go right it's these guys with you know, the power, and then it's just a bunch of teams like, please, sir, please give us, you know, that's kind of what it is. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, we don't, well, I mean, I, I don't like I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it because we can just talk about the allegations that are made here, which is that like basically 50% of your sponsorship deals go into the pool, get paid back into the league, mm. which is yeah. crazy that your sales yeah. team is if doing sponsorship know, sales. I, 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 maybe you can answer this. I know you know a lot about sports, Harris. When things happen, like I remember a very famous one was the Lakers sold to like that, like uh, like some big channel. I think it was like a, a one in their area to sell to carry the Laker games, and they got like so like a billion dollars or something mad for like I'm mean, gonna guess like ten years of like Laker games or something. If they do that, do they contribute some of that back to the NBA? Is that just their business thing of the Lakers profit? What happens in real sports if you have a big there sponsorship? Are revenue, you know, there are revenue shares that exist. Actually, the NFL is a great example of it because there's massive revenue shares that exist between the big, the bigger markets and the smaller markets and actually um now i don't want to you know i know i'm talking with two people that are you know from europe here so i don't yeah. want to speak out of turn but i do believe I, I, that i lived in america for a while i, I was devastated to have to leave no, and no, he means because he means because he's referencing when that philip here i made the audacity to say he knew about oh. the english premier league and i bodied him so it's all right yeah, it's a yeah, it's yeah, a yeah, 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 so well, okay, don't worry he's, Got to got to be cautious. I get it. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> so I would also say that I think that the and I, I I'm trying to remember. I think that the EPL actually was formed, um, basically be, be, because it had the top. I think it wasn't broadcast they, rights. It was like Sky or whatever with the they are famous. Yes. It's the main reason why like football is so big in England, basically. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And so and and that and then they had that sharing. And so actually, I think that what ended up happening was didn't they want to create a super league at some point in the, in the you know because they were sharing with league. all these other teams. Yeah. They want to have all these big teams. Yeah. And, and then they were going to share all that money amongst the big teams, right? Like so, I do think that that is typically kind of how this kind of stuff works. And I think that um, particularly in like the NHL or in, you know in the NHL, you're looking at the uh, NFL in particular, like. The NHL's biggest revenue stream is going to be its its broadcasting deal that it has one with Rogers in Canada and then two with um, ESPN TNT right now. That's basically where all these teams are generating money. And if they're not generating money from that deal, where they're generating is from RSNs, regional sport networks, which basically broadcast them regionally in their home territories. Interesting conversations around whether that's an antitrust violation or not, too. But like, you know, not getting into that, like that is that is where they make most of the money, the broadcasting rights. And you're right. Like, the, and so actually, what's alleged in this lawsuit is that. I think, and, I, and you know, it requires a deeper reading, but I do think that they're basically saying that Activision went to Google and did a deal with Google for the broadcasting rights, and they didn't get the best deal for the league, I think is kind yeah. of what they're saying there. I think they're saying they wanted to make use of their, I think it was like their cloud software or something like that. I don't even... Yeah, it was, the yeah, there was basically server. a bundled deal. Yeah, the cloud solution, yeah. Right, and so what they're basically saying is like, you had the opportunity to go make a lot of money in a broadcasting deal and you chose to, you know, benefit yourself for because the Activision is a conflicted party and like you, you know, have other services that you need service from Google, not necessarily just, you know, the broadcasting deal that you're doing over here. And so that would and, and if there is a revenue share, 
the in-kind contrib- the in-kind value that is derived from those cloud services would not be considered part of the revenue shares. And it's actually really interesting, not going to name any names on, on certain leagues, but in the past where there have been revenue share agreements or in the past where there are there are revenue shares that exist, the question is how much money gets contributed back into that pool. And if there are these kinds of broader, you know, organization level deals that exist where it's not necessarily just the league, but it's maybe the broader the broader publisher is doing a deal with a broadcaster, there's a question of how much of that money we allocate to the pool. And guess who gets to determine that? The publisher. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you know, these kinds of things are, you know, it it, it, it doesn't sound good, it doesn't smell right because what is we're talking about we're trying to monetize a league. We're not even allowing the teams to go make as much money as they should be based on any traditional sports, right? This is basically Which is just mad when sponsorship is the yeah. number one revenue generator yeah. for the teams. It's yeah. like here, yeah. teams have some peanuts. Like I'm going to give you something, and then really that doesn't even but work they, anyway. But this was this was the interesting part because it's like so. Think about right. R- remember what we were told about these franchise leagues that Activision Blizzard were running. We were told it was going to. Uh, create a whole new ability to monetize. Um, And one of the reasons that all the team owners were super keen to do it was because once your slot is valued at something, it's like an asset and you can go get a loan against it and all that other bullshit, right? So that, that was that was one of the reasons they they were very big on the idea of uh, they didn't mind paying 10 million, 20 million, 27 million for a slot because now I own something worth that and I and I can get, get value against that. But then the, the the problem has been when it came to the monetization, you're in a league. The league is going to have computer sponsors, whatever computer you compete on, right? you know, Intel or D, your Omen or whatever it is, right? Um, they're always going to have a energy drink sponsor, you know, G Fuel, you know, whatever. And they're going to go through and they're going to fill all the slots you would expect of any sports league. And sometimes they're going to go in the crazy areas the official automobile of lcs like you know like half of the, your audience can't fucking drive like what, what are we doing okay cool i guess so you know you, you're gonna go into these areas and then every time the league goes into one of those areas they you can't okay so then you go okay well i can get a gambling partner then the league takes a moral exception to gambling Ah, oh, shit. <laughs> Got to leave all that gambling money on the table. Well, the and, crypto, and liquor and uh, cannabis yeah, and crypto. And then they do it for crypto. And, the and then they do and it for booze. And, and then they do it for firearms. And they, they say, you can't advertise your favorite gun. You can't have a Sig Sauer fucking commercial run on your stream. But Which here's is the hilarious, USS that is the TS That is the TSM logo, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, complete rip off. Right. So, so, so uh, you know, it, 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 it gets to this point where, like, I, I never understood why you would agree to this because if you operated outside of that league, like a, a team, an organization like Optic have some of the best sponsor sales te- like ever in esports. Like put it this way, it's the same for FaZe. They're a, they're a dog shit organization in almost every other area, but some of their crossovers have been fucking insane. And you've got FaZe Banks in a fucking, you know, helping Batman in an in official DC comic. Like this is insane, right? This mcdonald's you know like uh, so why would anyone ever acquiesce to like not you know to to having to like have pre-approval on the sponsors if you're in the league and then what little few crumbs you can get from the sponsorship table by the way we we still take 50 yeah, percent. yeah i mean I, that, I, that is insane to me like yeah, and again, I can't comment on the terms of the revenue share if there is any. Like, I, I can't really talk about that stuff because it is uh, it is confidential. But I, I would just say this: like, at least in the Overwatch League, we can look at this. We can look at this. Like, what? Like, we think back to the beginning of the Overwatch League. You know, you know what you couldn't do in the Overwatch League? You had to make a separate brand. The reason was because they yeah, wanted to separate. They things. wanted to separate out those sponsors. When a sponsor so- sponsors a team, they're sponsoring the brand, and so that was actually kind of a response to this idea. I think uh, that you're kind of mentioning right now. Um, but I but I would agree with you. I think that really just comes down to like where people just you know they were taking investment and they're taking investment from professional sports teams who are now like you you see the New York Islanders were sold for five hundred sixty million dollars. The, the the Clippers were sold for two billion dollars. Right? Like, what are they actually buying? They're buying a spot in the NBA. They're buying a right to potentially receive some of the revenue share from the broadcasting deal, right? Like that's what they're buying. And so they're, they're kind of just like, 
Well, that's going to happen in esports too, right? Yeah. The reality is, it, it, but it the wasn't, NBA doesn't it, take fifty percent of all sponsorships. No, of course not. It, 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 of that, course that's what not. I'm saying. It's it's like these leagues want to be like sports leagues, but some sort of like like a capitalist like uh, 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 Reddit's perception of the evil capitalists like wet dream of, of what a league could be like fifty percent off the top. It's like that's not happening in any of these other sports leagues. So right. I, that's that's where I think like surely. If this case was ever to go to court, or you ever to make like a legal argument about it, you get a breakdown of what the NFL does and what the NFL takes and what it costs to be in there and what you agree to. You know, they share they share the merchandise revenue, for example. Um, you know, well, they share rather they share the sponsorship deal of Fanatics or whoever makes the official apparel. They all get. Yeah, well, what'll happen is you'll have all the brands contribute their IP to NFL properties, yeah. and then NFL properties will license that out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, then, yeah. and they have they have its joint ownership of that or, or joint revenue share. Yeah. But what what's not happening is there isn't this fifty percent downstream of you know I'm the Vegas Raiders. I go out and get a wicked sponsorship deal with like a sports betting company because we're opening up that can of worms in football now. And uh, you know I'm not putting fifty percent of that back into the league. Like you know the Patriots ain't getting a cut of that. So it's like it's 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 crazy to me that these leagues operate under this kind of you know veneer of being like a sports league it's a franchise league it has none of the protections for team owners none of the protections for players there's no like entity there's no mechanism through which you can collectively bargain except getting around the table with activision and just letting them fucking long dick you with their terms and then well, on top of that you, there's 50 percent off the top of the shit so that's you yourself generate for yourself that's actually really interesting too, and and it actually I I do you know slightly mention this in the article because if Activision's uh, claim is that basically you know it had unilateral control of everything and therefore it can't be conspiring with other teams because it's just imposing things on them and therefore it's not you know a, a section one of the Sherman Act requires a conspiracy essentially to restrain yeah. trade and they're just like well we're not conspiring it's just us right like we have the right to do this it's our exclusive right <laughs> and we're just imposing these terms on these teams so we're not conspiring right okay we'll, we'll you'll take that as it is if you actually were to make that argument then it's like okay well like you're controlling everything you just kind of acknowledge that like does that mean you also control the schedules do you control the player contracts for these players are you an employer of these players like oh you are like oh so you're like a joint employer okay like that's a thing that's and and that's actually an impediment right now to you know not to go back to the unionization but we've, we've talked about this in the past you just mentioned collective yeah. bargaining right like the reason we can't collectively bargain is because well one like you know the lcspa or whatever players association we're, we're talking about basically they don't want to push this issue because they don't know who to bring into the issue. The reality is they should probably be bringing in some of these game developers as well because they probably are joint employers. And, you know, the question would be like, well, what's the response if we were actually to go ahead and, and do that? Well, that? You know, Activision Blizzard or whomever might just shut down the whole fucking league because they don't want to deal with the headache. Yeah. And the reason I, I think one of the reasons they may just shut down the whole fucking league, which is why this is such a fraught issue about player unionization in the United States right now among esports professionals, is that if you are a Riot Games and the, L the LCS Players Association attempts to become a union, you are going to be dragged into this for the reasons that Harris says. And then what happens if they form a union? Because then... If you allow that to happen, do the rest of your the Riot employees form a union? Like, let's pretend that, that Riot is legally a joint employer of the professional players. Well, then Riot is setting a precedent that it's, like, acceptable or even that they want them to form unions. In which case, clearly what they don't want to happen is for all Riot employees to form a union that could then challenge, you know, the 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 system that's been going on now we can argue whether they should form a union or not maybe with these layoffs people sure. are thinking about that i don't know like but the the anti-union you know crackdown among game developers has been very severe it is actually like it, it's it's super interesting that you um that you mentioned that multi i i actually like talk about this in the salary cap article that i wrote which is a much different kind of article than the one that i i wrote on the antitrust it's much more economics based like i, I talk a lot more about like the economics of salary caps and, oh, and revenue shares other leagues yeah sorry <laughs> um but but um Some light the point reading was, for later <laughs> yeah the point that i make in that though at the end is like well well wait a second like the best course of action here remains and is it could be kind of analogized to what we're talking about right now riot should just step out of the way or activision should just step out of the way and allow this to exist outside the framework of we need to control everything because 
in doing so, they one, they subject themselves to liability. Two, they create weird incentives that exist, as Monty was just discussing, with their potent, with their other employees of their primary business, right? And then they run into antitrust issues. So really, just get the fuck out of the way. Who cares? Let us do it. Like, <laughs> let it function like it functions in every fucking professional sport where it works. Just let it work. Stop. I mean, the joke is essentially the analogy you could even <laughs> give to sell the game devs is this is like TSM. If you really do have a functional business that's an app and a website, just take the cancerous esports growth off it, you fucking idiot, <laughs> and just actually have all the profit. So if you make the game, you're already going to print money from the fucking idiots buying the COD shit and all the fucking skins and all the games. Like, why not just let, instead of you yourself running esports at a loss, I understand why Riot does it for control purposes, but yeah. if you're another one, like he says, get out the way the joke is the the dream point i was talking about in the industry pretty much was when these game devs didn't run everything it was actually when the industry organically grew up from literal no. land parties like at the most grassroots level and by the way one other th quick thing to say is the other reason why now it looks so silly that everyone bought into overwatch league i'll give you a reason a speculation as to why because it fits in with richard's theory about how a lot of the american endemic owners think because here's the thing i understand i would speculate that the real sports and owners and big businessmen they just got tricked by bobby Kotick, or essentially it's like if you do a friends and family thing it's like they just believed in him and he was like don't worry i'll make sure it works and i'll get all the strings pulled so they just came along because they were told it's the hot new thing right i think the endemic ones were the fucking marks and i have said since day one the only customer the overwatch league ever had was the idiot endemic owner who bought in for 20 odd million like that's why they had to service you the whole time it's never about the fan he was never paying fuck all the sponsors were dropping the bucket so here's what i think they did it for even though when you put it out like that, like, look at the terms. The deal's trash on every level. The buy-in's way too high. You'll never make it off that. The game doesn't have any people viewing it. It has barely any sponsorships. And if it does, you're going to have conflicts with the actual league itself. You don't even get to use your own brand you built up. You're making a totally artificial brand. You have to pretend as a different company, even though it's the same employees. And then this is the crappest part of all, is... I think the reason they got tricked is because they know that it's hard to get sponsorships and they're already still in the gaming sphere. Of I think what they thought for real was this. I'll just use the example of Robert Kraft. I think they thought that the localization was the whole mechanism. I think what they thought was, here's the thing. I obviously don't know how to like monetize a team in Florida, but Robert Kraft's from fucking Boston. It's the Patriots, bro. Like, you think he's not going to have, like, Sam Adams sponsoring his team, and then he's going to get all... So all that all I'll do is I'll copy his playbook, because you know this, Richard. It's a fucking follower industry, is these spots. Oh, it's totally. fucking lemmings following the last one off the cliff, going, fuck, I hope I can fly, and they don't give a fuck that they don't know what they're doing. They just hope the guy in the front of the centipede is eating a really tasty meal, the human centipede analogy <laughs> that I'll always use on every show, if that's mad inappropriate. So, basically, yeah, that's what I think they thought. I think they thought these guys have got all figure out and basically if I just like draft behind them NASCAR style like I'll get it all too and then the joke is at the end there was fuck all for anyone and they didn't get all those things and the monetization never happened well, locally so well, I, I mean that I, was I, the so essentially I'll just say this I actually think for real the owners of like the endemic teams essentially got trapped in an aspirational scam you fucking idiots and you all thought you'd have like the fucking box your, your own box in like fucking giant stadium or something your dickhead instead you're being told to take the six million get the fuck out of my face <laughs> I, I say I, one I, thing. I, I sorry, you want to go on. Say lots of things. Say like an hour right. stuff. Keep going. Listen, man. I think that I think that there is something to be said for localization. I actually I think they just had no fucking idea how to do it. And just because you attach a name to something doesn't mean that it's going to be. You know, no one cares, right? Like, I, I mean, I, you guys know that better than anyone, right? So I, what I would say is, you know, here's how I actually look at it. Like, if you want people, you know what? You know what the biggest problem is? No one gives a fuck about the teams. That's it. I'm a team owner, and that, that's a fucking. I, I'm not a team owner. I was a team owner at one point. I'm a fucking, you know, I rep that. That's the truth. And I say that in my my, my article. Like, you have to be able to generate fandom. But what do you? I'm so scared. Fandom? That clip's now the one that's getting played on the projector in court. No, you cares about the teams. They're not representative. Like, did you or did you not say it? Well, listen, it's context, sir. <laughs> yes, I'm answer, please. Back to what you said. Yeah, I mean, listen, I'm, I'm, maybe it gets me in trouble, but I mean, I actually, I actually want to help people out. Like, and I actually think that this is helpful. That's your first like, mistake as a lawyer, mate. But keep going. Yeah, I know. I, I'm in the wrong. Place, but, uh, becoming a lawyer is a providence. Out the law is a bunch of fucking bullshit. That's the truth. Um, you know, <laughs> that's a completely separate topic we could talk about at some other point. Um, you know, bring it back. Bring it back. Get it tight. I mean, here's, here's the thing, guys. All lawyers are self-hating lawyers. That's the only kind that exists. No, I mean the concept of law is bullshit to begin with. But like, you know. <laughs> this is more you know philosophical but i think that um 
uh, yeah, all I would say is like, just talking about like localization, right? Like if you wanted to do localization, here's what I would do. We just, we just ran a really successful league in 2020 or 2021 where we were able to successfully transition from having people coming to a stadium, which isn't selling out, by the way. No one is going to these. I've been to the LCS. I've been to these stadiums before. There's plenty of empty seats, right? We transitioned from that massive production, and then we put it into you know, videotapes or, or I'm sorry, not videotapes, recordings of people playing at home. Like we had a camera and you would, you were watching the LCS, you would watch these people at home. You know what you could also do? You could say each one of these teams is required not to live in California with their buddies where they're all of going course, to the same you know, hookah lounge after yeah. every single day. Go live in New York and go, go contract with a land bar with a stage in the back and you sell tickets to that land bar and you, you generate interest and create real kinship with the people that go to that land bar and they sell merchandise and they sell drinks, they get fucking wasted and they're watching you play on that stage, you know, and then you're off and you're just hanging out with the buddies and it's grassroots again. And we're actually building a fucking fan base Green. as opposed to putting everybody over in California. Cause that doesn't work. And that's how you well, build local fan base. I mean, Harris, I've been arguing for 10 years that they should have put half the teams on the East Coast and then it just had an East Coast West Coast rivalry where you play like in conferences like in American sports and then you like cross over for a few games every season and then the championship is between one team from each of the conferences. I don't even but, think you need to have travel though. Like you just you just have people in their own separate or, separate well, now. Yes, now. The, yeah. No, I totally agree with that by the way. I totally agree with that. I think it's a great idea. Um I mean, I, I think that also it's important to note because we're some of the people who can talk about the early days of esports here, what esports was like before. Because like we're talking about, OK, so what happens like the 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 ramifications of this case, if Hex and Skump are willing to spend enough money and really like drive this as far as they can possibly drive it, possibly to the Supreme Court. We don't know where this is going. Right. It would be extremely expensive to do that. But if they can successfully break the developer stranglehold over esports, what we're actually doing is we're returning to a time where it wasn't that the developers didn't have the rights. It's that they didn't care. OK, and what I'm specifically referring to is not just the grassroots stuff like Harris's local smash scene or whatever, but there was a thriving professional circuit in the before era. And that before era was in Korea and it was StarCraft Brood War. And famously, it was later on with the release of StarCraft 2 that Blizzard came in and was like, fuck you guys. You've been doing this for over a decade uh, without really our, uh, you know, approval agreement. Um, even the, the grassroots culture of StarCraft came from pirated versions of StarCraft yep. that were played in the PC box. Because you have to understand that... The Asian financial crisis in 1997 sent a whole bunch of people out of work. And so they were in these low-cost PC bongs in Seoul in Korea, and they were all just hanging out playing cracked copies of StarCraft. And that's how you got this massive audience for StarCraft Brood War. And for Blizzard was entirely hands-off for basically, you know, from 1998 or 99 up until around 2009, right? That's when they started. That's when the lawsuits started flying and Blizzard started getting really pissed at the, the tournament operators. But what happened in this decade was that you had massive support for the professional scene. And what they did was create hands down the most advanced professional esports scene in the world for that entire decade where it was on television, not only one television station, but multiple television stations, because you had NBC game as well as OGN competing with the same players in their different tournaments. You had team leagues, you had individual leagues, you had Star League, you had, um, you know, MSL, you had the Pro League. And so what we saw, guys, was not, in fact, a, a bad professional scene. In fact, most of us who lived through that era look at that era of StarCraft and say this was some of the best esports because it wasn't about, there was nothing that was about selling StarCraft. Nothing. Yeah. It was not a marketing exercise for StarCraft whatsoever. It was purely the leagues and the teams creating a sports entertainment product. And that was pure and it was highly effective. 
and it was much. The dorm didn't do it for you. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) But by the way, here's the detail people might not know. Richard might be interested in this if you never looked into it or not. Is basically they were also the forerunners of what like Russia and China are potentially doing now with the copyright thing because that was also with that case. A lot of people don't know this. That was presented by Western idiots because unfortunately, I know it'll tell you, Harris, but even back then, people used to routinely hear the premise of a case and then go, "Well, it's obvious this person would win or lose." Like what? Mate, that's the reason you have a job. Like obviously you can't just disturb that immediately and go, well, no point carrying the case. So everyone said, well, they own the IP rights. So of course Blizzard has them over a barrel. If you've ever looked into that one, guys, it's very interesting because all you need to know is Blizzard started like, hey, you got to pay us this license. That was like mental. I think it might be like $10 million or something, right? That was like absurd amount. And all you need to know is in the end, it was settled and a licensing was done with Casper basically, which here's the thing. If Blizzard had them over a barrel, it wouldn't go that way, guys. It was implied to me from people who knew the case that even part of the case was sort of the Korean court system sort of telling Blizzard, you do know you're in Korea right now. This is a Korean business that's done its own things. And you're sort of a foreigner trying to tell us how it works based on essentially American copyright law. So like, I even got the vibe there. They were almost like, look, we're not going to go full China, but you know, back off a little bit. You have oh. to, let's all play nice and make <laughs> it. Know, that's why that thought went away, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, it was also the case as well, like we, we were speaking about the Korean stuff, that when when the match fixing scandal hit and everybody was losing, like put it this way, if, if Activision Blizzard had Kesper over a barrel at any point, they wouldn't have needed to have leveraged that to get StarCraft 2 in to be the the game yes. that these leagues because they tried exactly. to strong, yes. what, what happened is yes. they tried to strong arm what what Blizzard wanted to do with this this like direct interference was they were pissed that people were still watching Brood War when StarCraft yep, 2 was massively. out and they they wanted flash and jadong and all the 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 starcraft legends to be in starcraft 2 to transition that audience to sell the new game of starcraft 2 and to get people to play it in the pc bongs which would make them money so they were they were really trying to make everybody switch and so that's why a lot of this started occurring in korea in the first place Mm. but if you guys are wondering because many of you who watch our content were not esports fans in like the pre-2010 era and so if you wonder why why all of us are so incredibly salty about the way that esports are currently run it's because we actually know what if if this lawsuit were to break the stranglehold of the devs i think all of us would well i think what would happen now is the saudis would just take over everything so maybe i should yeah. be hesitant about whether or not I think this would be a good thing. But in theory, it's a good thing because we've seen what happens when the TOs who are making this not as a primarily as a marketing exercise, but as a entertainment business can do. And we know that the product is better. Like we know that that's the case. Um, And so I would celebrate in theory this thing, but I think that the reality at this juncture of this case going through is that if I'm the Saudi Arabian government and I'm ESL and all of a sudden League of Legends is in play, I literally just go to all of the best teams in the world and do exactly what you said about the, uh, the European football super Super league. league. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I I think that happens instantly with Saudi backing. I think that's what the esports world cup essentially is. I mean, in, in, but, yeah, the joke know. is here, even though in real football, they had to walk it back because their own fans said no. In esports, they would snap the Saudis hands off to take that deal today. Oh, yeah. If they are offered yeah. it, of course they would, guys. There would be yeah. no like, but what about what we built? The else? They'd just go tomorrow. <laughs> they would immediately be yeah. gone. <laughs> yeah. If you if you think that the, the, the top 20 teams in the world wouldn't immediately take all of because they're hurting as it is. But you if remember, you think, Conti, like, the other thing we should probably share in here is we're talking as well. It's like LCS. LCK themselves, like the biggest teams that spend oh, all yeah. the money, were saying, we don't make enough money from this. Like, our rev shares shit. We have problems with Riot oh. ourselves, etc. Yeah. They well, literally, even... I mean, the, uh, I think it was, uh, Genji basically said that they lost, I think it was $12 million a year. Uh, a couple, uh, on players' houses is what they were overspending. Um, and, and, and yeah, the wage... And now they've added to the miseries because they mentioned Taiwan <laughs> existing. So, <laughs> it's, g- goodbye, Genji. It was, it was I, real. I think, um, I mean, you guys know, I mean, Thorne, you did a you did a great piece on just talking about the wage to revenue ratio, um, actually in in the LCS too. And, and by the way, Monty, when you talk about the top twenty teams, I assume we're just not talking about any of the LCS teams too. So I think no, that, no, no, just... no, no. I know. I think some <laughs> well, of the they're not the top twenty teams. teams so. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, he actually does mean Cloud Nine. It would be involved. I know. I, mean, I know. I mean, I very specifically <laughs> good, mean like 
Cloud9, Team Liquid, you know, these teams that that have like, yeah, I totally appreciate what you're saying, like in terms of quality. But I think you want you absolutely want American brands within that league. And I also think that if I've said this a million times, if you centralize League of Legends competition in Asia, you would see American players be on good teams. Oh, be it's their, yeah. it's their be shitty the practice in NA that makes them bad. It's not an inherent lack of talent. Like we saw, I've said this a million times. We saw that with Overwatch League. You get all the players in one region, all of a sudden we see the, uh, players that probably if they were not living in Korea previously, were able to compete and win titles. Uh, you know, Western you players. Rosters, even. You even had Koreans and like Western as oh, well. Oh yeah. Of yeah. So I think, I think that would all like go away, frankly, if everybody was like in Seoul or whatever. Um, I mean, we saw this in Starcraft as well, but anyway, that's not the point. Uh, the, like, I think that what would happen is like, you would, you would see the, the ESL and like to what Richard was saying, the esports world cup is already playing Kingmaker with teams. Yeah. And I think they say, these are the most important brand. These are the 20 most important brands in the world. And even the Chinese teams, like, don't you think that some of these Chinese teams are, want to get away from the thunder talk and rare Adam shitters of their own league? Like they don't want to be involved with this. They would much rather be involved in a prestigious international circuit that would draw the best level of competition. And like, I, I pure, think for purely from a product perspective, what could be created would be amazing. Um, yeah. Now, do I like the Saudis owning it? Clearly not. But from a fan perspective, it's probably the best possible outcome. Just to give a bit of an anecdote right now on kind of like the, the degree of control that developers have and uh, publishers have. Like, yeah, I think yeah. that, you know, one thing that I, you know, it's very close to my heart is like Smash. Like I, I love Smash. I, I do commentary for it in my locals. I, I play all the time there. To get a license right now for Smash, you were literally... Nintendo, I don't actually think that they know kind of, well, based on my interactions, I don't want to talk too much about like my interactions with them, but like what they put in their licensing restrictions and on, on these people, you cannot have a sponsor. You literally can't have a sponsor, a sponsor of any sort, right? You just can't have a sponsor, right? The most you could charge for an entry fee in Smash is $20 and you cannot have more than 200 people attend. This is these are these are real restrictions. You just go oh, to their yeah. guidelines right now. It is insane what they are doing to this community, and you know whether or not they're actually going to enforce it. I don't even think they know at their corporate level the kind of bullshit that they just passed through in, the, in these in these licensing guidelines because like it doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. And also, I, I would say one more thing: like melee in general, like melee obviously is a game that is you know. I don't know, 20 something years old, right? It wasn't created with internet in, in mind, so you had to have this kind of um, an application called Slippy to basically play it online. They have completely outlawed, completely outlawed the competitive play of Slippy in any kind of tournament setting whatsoever. You cannot use Slippy to play in a tournament if you want to go get a license from Nintendo. They will just say no and they will enforce it against you. That is in their guidelines. You can't use Slippy. So you have it's to like be in person, is what you're it. saying. You can't they, play online. Right, exactly. And so they're basically just, they're, they're literally kneecapping their entire, the entire Melee online tournament. They already did it. It's gone. Hungrybox used to run a Wednesday uh, event every single week or, or a couple every, a couple times a month where he would basically put on a Melee event and that it's just gone. You can't do that anymore. And so this is the kind of control that these kinds of people have. And they don't even realize that they're doing it because it's, it's, it's just like, uh, we are like, they're like giants and I'm like an ant. And they're like, they don't even realize they're stepping on you. They don't even realize it, but they are, and it, it, it's so sad. I, I think, I think, I think that's a very generous. I think, I think that's generous, honestly. I think they do know they're stepping on you, and and I think they relish the fact that they're stepping on you. My experience with developers, you know, having talked to so many down the years, is they all believe that they are like essentially when it comes to the games that their company creates, they are gods. Any criticism of their perfect creation is bad. You must be exiled from Eden if you criticize their wondrous creation in all of its glory. And the way that they leverage their power and influence gets very insidious. And I'm going to loop it back into the lawsuit in just a moment. But, you know, for example, speaking from a journalist perspective, I've lost track of the, the amount of bullshit developers have foisted upon me in terms of blacklists and access to buildings, you know? Where, like, you know, what Riot would do is if any tournament of theirs was being played in a building, 
irrespective of how many other tournaments there were or who was who's who tournament it was they would strongly recommend i wasn't allowed press credentials they didn't want me anywhere near their game they didn't want me anywhere near anything so it's like so uh, they know they're stepping on you and to link this back to the the lawsuit is one of the things i thought was super interesting and i've seen this multiple times in esports and i hope if if nothing else we get a definitive and clear outline on whether this is right or wrong from a legal perspective but scump said that he was fined by activision oh yeah on, on his stream his own Twitch stream or whatever platform he's on, um, he said he, he had a sponsored Raid Shadow Legends stream. Yep. And it was it was in the off season. So they're not even competing. And because it fell afoul of the unbelievably broad what you can and can't show, what you can and can't have as a sponsor, because essentially it was a sponsored stream by another game, they they find him for that. But it was on his channel. The season wasn't taking part. And we know, obviously, from Duncan's day back in on Gamers, when Hearthstone was the new big game, high-level LCS players would play Hearthstone while they were waiting for a queue to pop. And basically, this pissed off all of the Riot executives. And so they changed the LCS contract to include a clause saying, very specifically, you cannot play other games while streaming our game. Now yeah. that has to be uh, illegal, like to dem- like to try and enforce that. That that type of overreach just it makes no sense to me. It makes no sense, but it's like it's never going to get challenged because an LCS player is literally the the far far weak. Even even a pro player is so weak in comparison to the IP rights holder. These video games developers. Why am I going to put myself in a legal nightmare? Four years of legal fees draining out of my bank account, or maybe I just don't play Hearthstone. Like you know, which is it? So I I, I actually think developers are narcissists. Like at, at their core, all of the executive, all of the C-suite, all of their legal, all of their counsel. I think they're actually fucking blood-sucking evil vampires. I think they are scum. I I've never met one that I ever thought was capable of making a reasonable decision that wasn't totally self-centered. And 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 I, and I long for the day I can. But unfortunately, I don't think they exist. As I said, they're downstream of tech, and you will not meet bigger freaks than the people that run these big tech companies. Divorced from reality in, in a way that's like actually quite profound, almost willing, willingly divorced from reality. Well, so I mean, I I'll, just to tag on that, I wanted yeah. to quickly ask, say something here, Richard, which is this. To tie into the point he said about his local, right? The reason that's so obscene is because think about the story Monty told. Why wasn't Blizzard doing that court case in like 2001 when there was like the OSL was going? Because they didn't give a fuck about esports at the time. Esports wasn't a thing to them and it definitely wasn't going to be a moneymaker because you were essentially, there's no point coming in. You, there's nothing to get the money from. So what's exactly. disgusting about these game devs is it was literally people like us, sometimes us, that built this industry. That's why I said that I am esports tweet. It started with grassroots land tournaments and online cops and people managing them for free and initially no prize money or maybe we pay you to come to the land and shit like that. And it was literally an aspirational industry that just ran off people who were hobbyists just giving their life to this game. And by the way, insane amounts of unpaid man hours and elbow grease to get it off the ground. And so the the problem I have is this. It'd be very different if the person they're trying to fuck with and crush is ESL or some giant TO that is worth billion dollars, etc. No, no. They're going to come and put their boot on the little guy doing essentially the LAN party. That is how this fucking thing began yeah. at the very start. Like, that's at that point in time, you are just saying, like, essentially, fuck everyone else. I'm pulling up the ladder. You don't get to do any of this. It's like, but the joke is, you wouldn't even have made that decision if they had. Hadn't have built that scene for you first, so that's why. Even though it might just be like we said, like we don't, I don't really care about what tournament that is. I probably don't know any of the players, but just like the, almost like the principle of what you're doing is so fucking gross optically. Yeah. And it, and it, for me, it, it's it is like you know these these uh, at least in Smash, like it, it is still very grassroots. Like people like they make these communities and they just have these things every week and they just go in there on a Sunday and hanging out and like you're literally telling these people no, you can't do that. Actually, one of the restrictions of the Nintendo guidelines is you can't serve alcohol at a place where a tournament is taking place. And it's just like, oh, so I guess I can't have, you know, my bar can't host tournaments anymore. Like, 
okay like <laughs> bye bye like just get rid of that you can't do that like it's it is it is really you know it is upsetting it is evil and i think that these people that you know we'll see what kind of comes to them i i do hope that it kind of this progresses and i hope that they do but it, it will probably take a lot of money it'll take a lot of a lot of legal hours and it takes it takes will and so just to kind of bring it back to this like we'll see if they have the will to go ahead and, and do all that like i'm not confident do, do they you do. have any specific thoughts on a games developer telling you you can't stream other people's games on your twitch stream do you have any thoughts about that i mean it's just another type of overreach right we actually negotiated and i i can't talk about you know sure. this kinds of things but like there have been team participation agreements where that has existed and we have we've done everything we can to remove that because what ends up happening is it's a pass-through term you have the teams basically being told by the developer that you can't do that and then we have to pass that through to the players and so we've we've tried to fight that because you know, we think it's bullshit, and it is bullshit. And, and really, also, not only is it bullshit, it also restricts our ability to, to monetize. Because, as you just mentioned, like, you know who pays a lot of money? Raid Shadowlands. Whatever the hell their name is, right? Like, they pay a ton of money. They do a lot of ads. And so we, we can't monetize that anymore. So, um, you know, talent agency act questions aside. But, By know. the way, I'm low-key so scared, though. That's the real problem is this is all great while it's like the first act of the movie and they're going to fight for justice and they're not going to give up until they bloody get what they deserve. But I'm so scared that it is just like Richard said and they just like, they just dole off the top like a cool 20 mil to each fucking scump and hex. And then the joke is they're just rocking some massive like blizzard bling like bah, 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 new, new, new world on new world on new world on and then they just fucking sided with them. Like, I'm scared that's going to happen though. That's why I'm worried about it. I mean, keep in mind, my, 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 the entire premise behind why I believe they will settle is purely on the basis that i think it will be a similar settlement where it's like like uh, harris pointed out earlier we admit no wrongdoing but we're just sort of making this go away and then and then whoever wants to litigate you're essentially re-litigating you know so so let's say in that in the example another player did come along and you know like you know twice or whoever big name big name player wanted to go down the same route as scump you've got to get the money for the lawsuit you've got to file it you you're going to get told it's meritless there's going to be a file for the and you, you are going to have to go down the same road and, and you aren't guaranteed the same outcome. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think this, this lawsuit is notable by who, for who the plaintiffs are. We are talking about some of the biggest contributors to Call of Duty history and people that you cannot make a compelling argument. Like, say, for example, if Optic want to make a legal argument, the reason we coerced Hector to have a partner uh it, it, because we want a particular type of partner is we had concerns about how the franchise would be run he has run the most successful franchise before the cdl so you, his credentials are unimpeachable on that on that basis so my immediate thought would be you must have another reason for that because to try and make a compelling argument to say hector can't run a franchise when he's been running a franchise uh, you know, there's so many little parts to the lawsuit that I just think like it's that's actually... why even that part you're referring to, even that racial part was like a weird angle almost because that's another area where you, this is why actually I also want way more of these, even though I don't like the law and out the overreach and stuff. Mm. The reason why I do want lawsuits like this to happen is because. Like, where the fuck are these execs and people and these game devs living where they think they can just walk around and say stuff out loud? Like, you don't really look at this sort of owner we'd want. What are you saying? Like, that should absolutely yeah, no. be something. And one day you should be asked in court, did you say that to this person? Did you essentially, like, influence them in a certain way or imply something? Like, that's outrageous things to say. That's the only sort of thing you say when you do think, like, these game devs Richard's talking about. Don't think they're ever going to be accountable and they're living out some succession fantasy where they're like, I'm going to fuck you on this deal, bro. Like, they're thinking they can think, say anything, think, mate. Like, this reaper. About to these statements. Yeah, think think about how, I mean, again, I'm assuming it's true. Like, Hector's a lot of things. A, a liar he isn't, right? Um, Hector's as real as it fucking gets, in, especially in this business. And so I, I, I am taking the lawsuit at face value. I know bits will get shaved off and contested, and what will end up being the, the core of the case, if it proceeds, will look very different to this initial filing. But I'm taking all of the, like, the specific allegations, the claims of being fined. I, I think Scump and Hector's reputation is, again, unimpeachable. I, I don't think you can say these guys are liars. But anyway, uh, th go back to 2017, right? And, and Hector is always, like, he's always talked openly about his Mexican heritage. Big part of who he is. He's always talked about it openly. And when uh, Chipotle first came into esports, like, Hector was doing all this great content around. Hector got that sponsorship. 
It, 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 for optic. Like, I know everyone was all, like, high-fiving at Evo because they were giving out free Chipotle stuff. No, he got cash money from Chipotle and brought a huge brand that does Mexican food in, in, into his org. Like, what are you saying, CDL? Like, what are you saying about Hector's capacity to run? That is a huge fucking sponsorship deal. You didn't, you didn't bring in that whale. Hector right. did that. And, and 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 again, this nominal idea of like, you know, oh, we we don't you don't look like our typical uh, manager. Well, like again, here's proof of how like the diversity paradigm works. Like, you you know what I mean? Like, it you, also you shows people like Blizzard don't believe in that shit. They just say it yeah, for market exactly. purposes. Yeah, you 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 think you think there's a just some a weird coincidence between like Hector, you know, proud of his Mexican heritage, landing a sponsor that sells Mexican food. You think these things exist in a vacuum? No, it, it's this is what I mean. It's like. Of all the people to be saying negative things about just because you're bitter, your fever dream of a franchise league didn't work out, to attack Scum, to attack Hector in the way that they have with their first statement, uh, and, and, and if these allegations are true, it's actually despicable. I mean, you know, I, I want to make that abundantly clear. And the things they're saying just don't hold up at all. The attitudes they've taken don't hold up at all. Hector's one of the most successful esports owners of all time, who ultimately fell afoul of all of the problems generated by all of the other team owner assholes that just thought they could spend VC in an endless procession and there would always be more. You know, he he does he wouldn't sell to Infinite if that like it's life changing money. He's got a family, like, you know, he did it, he instantly regretted it. He he eventually got it back and then got fucked over again. There's something very wrong with how these developers think about the people that build things that offer value to them, but they can only think about dollars. They don't think about value that isn't monetary. And, you know, until they start wrapping their head around that, which they won't, because they're all greedy asshole companies, uh, esports is always going to have this friction between these parties, the builders, the believers, and the exploiters, the developers. It doesn't really fit together neatly in any way, shape, or form with the current legal fr framework. I Which again, it's why this case is, you know, super. I have so many things I want. I, I want to say about that. <laughs> like, just so many things. Just so many things. Um, I can't share. I, I wish I could. Uh, <laughs> That's fine, bro. But I, I, I can totally say, get it. I, I'll, I'll say one thing. You know, I, there. You know, there have been times I totally. You, you mentioned like getting denied press. Like, you know, people get. You know, this kind of happens. This happened with Riot. I, I mean. Back in 2016, and I, you know, I, I was working with H2K at the time, and I remember, um, you know, Jacob Wolf, who is a friend of mine, he, he reported on Rocks Tigers essentially, right? And Rocks Tigers essentially was, you know, they were going to be folding, they were going under, or whatever the hell it was. And that day at the Chicago Theater, that's where the uh, World Championship uh, quarterfinals were in 2016, uh, they kicked him out of the studio. They wouldn't give him a press pass. And they literally said, get out of here. He's with ESPN. He's one of the biggest people covering this thing at the time. They didn't want him because he was, he was talking shit about them, I guess, or, or it had the uh, opportunity to kind of upset the framework of what they were trying to have in that theater at the time. And, you know, they, they kicked him out of the studio. And so I actually just said, you know, I'll, I'll bring my players to you. We'll do some, some stuff outside and we'll, we'll do some interviews I mean, over here. Harris, as part of that same thing, you may not know this, but uh, they accused my wife, who was not at that world championship, uh, because she was friends with the Rocks Tigers. Riot accused my wife of giving Jacob that information and then tried to get her fired from Twitch. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. I, mean, but that's, that's, <laughs> I do hope that at some point there's kind of some sort of uh, there's a reckoning here, and, and we'll see if this is it. And I completely agree with everything that you said. I don't have any reason to believe that this you know this wouldn't be true and i think that to be completely honest with you we have to assume that everything that they're going to allege is true because that's the standard for a motion to dismiss and so yeah. what will likely happen here is um unless it's patently false i mean, I think that what's likely to happen here is we'll see a motion to dismiss we'll see the response from uh the plaintiffs and we'll see kind of how that flushes out they'll make their allegations a little bit clearer in those briefs and we'll be covering that every step of the way by the way we'll we'll be talking about that because if they actually want to proceed with this, then I think that that does have, you know, it has a big impact potential on the industry. Yeah. Um, I'm looking forward to, I mean, like, by the way, I, I did have time to read your article before we went live. I think, um, I think it's a very good sort of summary, even though, as I said, I, I, my gut is telling me that this is destined to settle somewhere along the line, particularly with the new executive body of, of Microsoft. But I really hope it, even if, even if that's the eventual outcome, I definitely want to see some argumentation 
Like you, yeah. you, know, you know, I what hadn't I mean? even thought of that angle, Richard. Obviously, Microsoft's buying Activision, and then someone yeah. immediately does like an antitrust thing against. Well, them. I've oh, already been told. Real. But I've already not been again, told. Not by, again. Yeah. No, I've already been told by by sources. Uh, you know, and I, I do know some people over on the uh, uh, Microsoft side. I mean, basically, they were. So what I've, what I've been told, and obviously, it's not solid enough to report, but I'm pretty sure it's true. And I've I've talked to some of the people, and they say this is true. So that you know, apparently, Microsoft don't even want to keep the league running, making any sort of agreement of we won't do that in future, kind of moot because they they don't want the headache uh, of the Call of Duty league. So they're just going to get it off the books, and they're going to allow Call of Duty to be again outsourced as as an esport. But they're also fucking furious. They're furious that this is happening. Like as I said, they envisioned this was going to be a clean sweep. They're going to resurrect some all beloved IP. We've installed our guys. They're all saying the right things publicly everyone's believing in blizzard again everyone's believing in activision again shit they might even make a good fucking game like imagine it share prices going up and then this big dollop of shit lurid headline 680 million dollars you know intimated racial animus like can you imagine just taking over and going is, is there anything that fucking isn't rotten and garbage in this side of the business so i i honestly think there might even just be pressure to actually sort of make this go away relatively quickly uh, but I, but i don't know but again it's, that's what i'm that's the chatter uh, like, yeah that way, that's what, like, i mean they had an opportunity to make this go away relatively quickly before filing you have to remember that too right like there's there's going to be true, yeah. Yeah, there's going to be conversations and, you know, I'm I'm pretty confident from some people I've spoken to that there have been such conversations or there were conversations before this was filed that there was, you know, that oh, they were sure. trying to make. Yeah. And so they didn't want it to go away then. And so uh, the question is why? Do they think they were just bluffing that they're not going to go ahead and file a lawsuit or, you know, that, well, now they fucking filed a lawsuit and there's the dollop of shit. So, yeah. you know, here you go. You reap what you sow, asshole. Right. So yeah. that's kind of I, I the mean, way I would. No, for sure. And, and, and it's. It's like I say, it's just a shame because I think in retrospect, like 10 years from now, we're all going to look back at these franchise leagues and we're going to see them as perhaps some of the like the biggest failures ever in the esports space. Uh, it, it, it Maybe even arguably some of the biggest failures in media. I, I, I would even go that far. Um, you know, with the, with the amount of money that was put in and the promises that were made and just how mm, none of that I is I don't know, aligned. Quibi exists. <laughs> Well, okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, but 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 I think you know that people are going to write books about this. People are going to publish white papers about this. There's probably going to be more and more lawsuits around this at various points. I don't think this will be the be all and end all, particularly dependent on how this one goes. And it's it's just like it's like I say, it's the sheer it's a, go Star Wars. It's the sheer fucking hubris of it all. Like that, that I, I if if Hector wins this, a hundred percent. Like I, I would say, like I mean, he's the hero you know, of esports of all time. If he wins this, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like him and him and Scump winning this. What what the Scump stuff would do for player rights? Because we haven't even talked about how you know pressure didn't sign in a contract, told he couldn't talk to his counsel. Yeah which is unbelievably problematic and, and the, the stuff with the Twitch streams and not being able to have your own sponsors. Um, and obviously Hector from a broader perspective of this disastrous franchise model that was foisted upon all of us. I mean, yeah, obviously these guys would go out on their fucking shields like absolute fucking heroes. And if they, you know, even, even if you get Activision to admit some wrongdoing or acquiesce or they get a settlement, they've absolutely come up big on this one because the contents of the lawsuit are super fascinating and they've given everybody a window into just how bad this system was um, and why nobody should ever have adopted it. They should have gone down the nade shot route and sort of said... It's tough, but we're not going to be in. We can't agree to those terms. So, yeah, I mean, lots of thoughts on this one. I'm going to be following it religiously. I've already signed up with my Pacer account for, like, doc docket updates. So I'm going to be feasting on this for a while. But but I definitely think uh, for Activision to say this is broadly meritless, which, of course, they have to, but, but I, 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 you know, not a lawyer, but I don't feel that way about I think there's I think there's, like, a couple of things in this that they're absolutely bang to rights on. That's my read. Yeah, and I think that's mostly on the competitive ta uh, the competitive balance tax, and you know, there's some other stuff with respect to just you know unreasonable restraints on trade that you were kind of raising before, which could actually also be, you know, violative of the, of Section One. I think that the Section One claims of the Sherman Antitrust Act, which deal with more you know the, the individual restrictions that we're talking about, those I think are much 
you know, they have a better chance on those than the broader duty to deal, the, the section two, you monopolize this entire industry. But we'll see. We talked a little bit, of, we, I mean, not to rehash it, we talked about the, you know, the, the legal history on it. So you go back in this video if you want to at some point, you know, or, you hear me lecture on it. I would also say, by the way, um, the footnotes in the article that I wrote do discuss uh, quite a lot of the, the I, I kind of give a summary of it, but the footnotes actually provide the legal specifics and the, the case law as well yeah. as the interpretation. So I would recommend if you're interested in that. I'm, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to read some of those cases actually, because it's always nice to get citations um, and yeah. sort of have a better understanding of US case law. So yeah, I've done a bang up job there. I'm really looking forward to diving into it. Yeah. All I would like to say at the end is the reason why I low key, this is actually part of how I want esports to be destroyed by itself, is something like this, where there's like a landmark case, all the people with all the money have to get the fuck out, we start over again. Because the thing is, with these massive game devs, like I am sick of them actually thinking they rule everything. Like, you know what? Pull the, pull the, pull the other one. It's got bells on it. Because you know what? <laughs> I don't want to hear you parroting a bunch of bullshit that you've heard that you think is going to pass because I've got a fucking long neck. And I tell you what, I can carry that shit for as long as I need to sustain myself and I don't forget. OK, so there we go. There we go, kids. That's the explanation for you. That's the, that's the show and tell part. It's all good. Uh, bring in props. He's got props. Yeah, bring it, well, he's back. He's back to the prop comedy era. Thoroughly. And those were all from Kinder Eggs. Don't worry. They were all from Kinder Not a sponsor, just a delicious product that you can't get in America because they have chalky hazards in. So, but I I don't swallow them. I but enough about Team Liquid. Points. Exactly. <laughs> so, you your final thoughts, Monty? I guess we're at the end. I uh, look. You know, I this is one of those times where there is just a you you feel like there's a possible glimmer of hope within the esports industry where you say. Oh, yeah, I remember what it was like when we had professional tournament production and operation prior to developer overreach and interference. And then you remember that, as I said earlier, the what would actually happen is that if the shackles were to be broken, then it would just be the Chinese and Saudi governments that would take this thing over because they have way more money to do it than anyone else and a desire to deploy that capital. So... Mm -hmm. There is no bright future, really. Like, Hex and Scump would be heroes for liberating this. And maybe on an individual content creator scale, it would be good. Because you have to remember that one of the other factors of all of this is co-streaming privileges as well. We didn't even touch on that. But basically, oh, they, they not only... all just co-stream, it would be the dream. Yeah. That, would, like, that alone could turn the whole industry upside down, of course. Yeah, exactly. Because they control, you know, the way that that the any of these companies, tournament organizers, developers deal with co-streamers right now is that you have to agree that you aren't going to basically talk shit about them. If you're going to co-stream on ESL, better not be talking about the Saudis. If you're going to co-stream for Riot, better be not talking yeah. about that hundred it's million dollar lawsuit. If you actually man. look at what they put into the co-streaming contract, it's like you can't speak ill about them, about the game, about yeah. any of their sponsors, any of their subsidiaries, any other game that they've made, any investor, like, holy shit. Like, so just zero criticism of any kind, I guess. Like, I mean, like, how, how are they so fucking fragile? I just don't understand it. I, like, can't understand. Yeah. You, I, I have built a world where I am immune to criticism. Like, nice one. Yeah, wicked. That, yeah, that, that, and that's a really good place to live, isn't it? And you can't have certain sponsors. Like, you can't have yeah. betting sponsors on co-streams. So, like, I mean, you even know Valve are guilty of this. Think about how mad it is that Steel, who is getting unbanned in 2025 from his indefinite match fixing ban. He's back to working events right now, but he cannot stream any of the uh, any of the Valve tournaments, so the RMRs and the majors. He can't even stream it and talk over it. It's yeah. like like guy guys, like what do you think he's gonna do? Like Tell you what, guys, I wish I was fucking match fixing this one. It'd be fucking great. <laughs> like, what? Like, what are you talking about? What, what, what could he possibly be saying? Yeah, like, what do you, what do you think happens? Well, like, yeah, yeah you, you'd so, easily get a dragon law for this one. Like, you know, it's just so I, dumb. Like, they're just so fragile. Yeah. And, and, and so, in a way, like, this would obviously open up a lot of very interesting avenues outside of just like who's creating the tournament and who is owning the leagues and who has control over those aspects. It opens it up from a content creator aspect as well, 
um, that could be very fascinating. And so as much as I as much as I dislike the fact that the end result of the professional scene would be a takeover by the Saudi Arabian government, at least in in the case that this existed, you could have independent content creators who were unfettered by, you know, an adherence to that policy. Because right now, the voices that would be promoted in any of these games are the ones who are going to be in agreement with, you know, covering up the truth of a lot of the situations that the developers and, and the Saudi government and the tournament organizers find themselves in. Um, and that's problematic. Like, at least there could be more of an independent voice in the space. So, do I think? That the end result of this is, as Harris has put it, a massive reshaping of copyright law. That seems implausible to me that this is like, is Hector going to be some kind of all time? Like, is this going to be a watershed moment by fucking video game hex and optic? Like, that would be shocking to me if that was the case. It feels like the industry isn't big enough yet. I think one of the. Here's an unfortunate fact, guys. The franchise system failed. Getting the billionaire sports owners failed. But if it had succeeded, I think Robert Kraft bringing this lawsuit might be the thing that does it. You know what I mean? So, like, had this gotten to the, the place where the vision of CDL and the vision of Overwatch League had been successful, it had grown into them, and they had built their own stadiums, I think at that point, the billionaire owners, they then fight the big legal battle, right? Uh, against the developers and so maybe that would have done it but it just to me right now feels too small to actually accomplish this and you know even though but hector is Kraft, you're our only hope fucking hell <laughs> <Hunch Andy's laughs> he's, the case. he's done it he's done it <laughs> but but i think i think maybe maybe that you know with their resources and some of the best lawyers in the world you know working on this case and as successful as Hector is, and he himself says he got $20 million from selling the Optic brand year, which is a lot of money, um, he is still poor compared to not only the might of Activision Blizzard slash Microsoft now, but, uh, you know, Harris, I would imagine that the other, you know, as this goes forward, if these claims are not dismissed, you have to imagine that Riot and Ubisoft and Valve are all going to get in on this shit. Mm. Like, they, surely they are going to start involving themselves in this case to a certain degree. So it's not just going to be Activision, Blizzard, or Microsoft, right? I mean, there's, there's I mean, like you said, we're talking, I, the way I put it, right, was that there's, you know, potential for a massive shaping or reshaping of kind of copyright of antitrust and it's in, it's interplay with you know intellectual property because remember antitrust the whole point of antitrust is to permit competition or to promote competition the whole point of intellectual property is to grant exclusivity monopoly they intersect they 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 hit each other and it's happening in copyright for the first like one of the first times at least that i can recall at least right so like it kind of is necessarily a conflict is it going to be hector that helps resolve all of these you know, issues like probably not, to be honest with you, like it, I, I don't think so. It just it seems is, unlikely, right? <laughs> it just seems unlikely. Right. And I, I think that, you know, it could. But at the, at the end of the day, I think they are correct to say, I, I think what, what we kind of glean from this, look, these are issues. These are big okay. fucking issues. And you are relying on outdated doctrine. And like, we need to update that shit because this doesn't make any fucking sense anymore. Like, there's just too much conflict. And maybe someone else brings something. I don't know. Like, some, somewhere along the line, this isn't going to last forever. I can't imagine that it does. And so no, it, the, do, the premise, I, the premise is just fucking absurd that I mean, yeah. it's the same thing that we have with fair use, generally speaking. Like, these are issues that in the digital era of media have to be addressed because it is it is completely ridiculous that a developer could own any instance of their IP being used, no matter how transformative it is, right? Like, how can they own, how can Activision Blizzard own every single YouTube video that shows Call of Duty gameplay? That is stupid. Yeah, I mean, I, they, they certainly could sue for, you know, they can, you're infringing if you use it, right? That's yeah. the idea, right? Yeah. And, that, and that's the issue. And, and I think that that is clearly not intended. Uh, I think that, I think, you know, when you look back on the 1983 case and you, and you look back, it was called Midway, I think, Manufacturers. Like, I think when you look back on that, you just read through that. You're like, this was a bunch of fucking bullshit. Like, you know, this doesn't, I mean, maybe it made sense at the time, but it doesn't make sense anymore. And, and there's all kinds of interesting copyright 
questions that kind of can emerge from this, right? Like, Harris, think about I have this. a question for you real quick. Do you think that the reason why the companies kind of give o- open license is not only because it's good marketing, right? And they want the game to proliferate, but is there a, an alternative reason, which is that they don't want this lawsuit to exist? So they don't, they just give it away because they realize that there might be some cracks yeah. here that need to be, I, I you think, know, I think they're... I think they're definitely cognizant of that they they're basically overeating right now, so to speak, right? Like I think that they right, they've right. taken they've taken more than they they probably deserve. Um, that's not to say they don't deserve anything, but like I think that there needs to be some sort of restriction on this, and they it get you know they don't want to fight that battle. Um, yeah. I would say like when you think about the way that copyright kind of emerged in the 1980s with this stuff, and then there's an interesting guy, his name is Professor Ochoa. Um, he wrote an he wrote a law review article called "Me Myself My Avatar," basically arguing that at some point like games can develop down the future where you could literally design a human-like figure with infinite possibilities of what is contained in that in that video game in like an mmo or something an avatar essentially and the that could be owned by not you but by the publisher and if the if that avatar in that game gains commercial like you know popularity or wants you know maybe this avatar wants to be on, on a billboard or something like that right or is sponsoring that avatar this this image that you've created that looks like a human like they own all that stuff you don't own shit and so it it doesn't make any sense. That's not what it was intended by this. You are expressing the creativity by going ahead and creating that person or that avatar in the first place. And so there's all kinds of interesting, nuanced legal arguments that could be made here. And I think that at some point they will be made. The question is, are they going to be made in the context of this antitrust lawsuit? We'll see how far they take it. I don't know. I think we should just reverse it, Harris, and we should allow companies to own our real life uh, intellectual property images. Right. Dude, don't like, even get me started because we'll end on a Doom <laughs> note. We'll end on a Doom note. You think about these fucking headsets and the and the AI and you don't even own physical media anymore. And that we've lost that one. That's gone. They can just lock you out of your accounts anytime you it's it's happening. Like imagine imagine we're gonna get like machines that like fucking you put in an AI prompt. Right. And, 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 you know, because that's obviously where we're headed with the content stuff. You put in an AI prompt, it's going to give you bespoke content, what you want, you know? Uh, so, uh, you know, if you want to watch like a fucking movie about, I don't know, one of the Avengers, you say your favorite Avenger, make me a movie where he has a fight with like Hydra and then this guy comes in at the end and it will do you a whole movie completely bespoke from start to finish. You just, because it's all, derivative garbage anyway just borrowing from all their ip all the examples all the books it's gonna have in there about the hero arc and the narratives the hero's journey all of that stuff it's gonna serve you up bespoke content that you gave from a prompt and then they're gonna like upload that shit there's gonna be some sort of reciprocal it stuff where exist. You, yeah yeah you feed back your thing and so your fantasies are now available to everyone else inside the fucking data cube with your headset <laughs> shit nothing's private you fucking virtual waifu talking to you, you know like dude fuck the, fuck what we're doing right now by the way like it's actually no joke is though it actually does if you think about it you could believe that uh, this uh, tech was already taken back in time and then what happened is Trindemir sat down and said the command prompt's going to be sort of daughter all stars but change the names of the characters and stuff like <laughs> yeah, and then exactly, it generated yeah. a game so you know but the problem is because exactly. it was you know they fuck up the fingers the spaghetti cord got everywhere and then something something, I mean, something. here we are here we are today. If, if you told me that league of legends was a scuffed version of an ai prompt i would believe you because only Oxable. a scuffed only a scuffed yes. ai would name the game league of legends but then call the characters champions instead of legends that's yes. a decision that only a scuffed ai could possibly yeah. make and then my <laughs> other joke was maybe peak six actually did five years ago have an advanced copy and they just put in the prompt like reproduce <laughs> an, an example of a successful c-suite set of executives and that was what the gemini one produced the, it's a very this is going to age really badly about five years but if you don't right now what everyone's talking about it's a bad yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's good that's good all right uh final thoughts harris we'll we'll link your article below as well as the a copy of the the document uh the, yeah, the actual sure. uh complaint. yeah I, I would say that you should re- you know i think this maybe this is controversial but generally speaking it's not that difficult to read this complaint like it's it's no. you know yeah. it's actually kind of fun to read the complaint because it talks about all the shit that's going on and you're just like oh that fucking happened like oh my god like you know you're telling me you made me sign a contract giving me time to, to, to read the contract like you're telling me like you know i got in trouble for raid shadow legends or whatever the hell it was like streaming it when it wasn't even during the season like it's actually kind of interesting it's it reads a bit like a drama 
And so, you know, read the complaint. Uh, then I would say, if you're interested in the, in the legal aspect of this, I'm, I'm obviously happy to talk about it always. Um, you know, message me on Twitter if you want to. I, we have an article that's up on this. We talk about all the citations. We have you know, all the authorities for this. We kind of, over the past couple of days, we've just been going back a couple hundred years, actually, to antitrust law to kind of figure some of this stuff out. And I've been in the law school library trying to, you know, read up on it as well. Separately, um, you know, we, we do a lot of publications on ESG's website, too. And so I put an article up about salary caps, too, which is more of an economic one, but yeah. I would recommend that, too. All I would say is technically, if you follow the Putin-esque answer that was given by Harris there, you could also, to fix all of this, you just go back in time and win the Revolutionary War for England. And basically, there wouldn't be an America, there wouldn't be any of this nonsense law. And at that point, I believe the king could decide who actually gets the license, which I think is the only honest way that power should be used in this world. God (laughs) bless the king. Yeah, God, God <laughs> save the king. Christ. We can talk about the history of Anglo-Saxon. Uh, we can talk about the history of Anglo-Saxon law if we want to, right? We're going back to. Uh, well, I don't need to talk about that. <laughs> it's a separate topic. If you ever want to do it, that's one of my. I actually love to talk about that kind of history. So. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, l- listen. Uh, thanks a lot, Harris, for making like what can at times be like a super undigestible topic uh, really interesting and engaging. Uh, it was great to get your thoughts. Um, so yeah, I think I think this was a fucking this was one of our banger episodes. Well done, boys. We didn't phone it in on this one. Everyone was on the top of their game. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thanks guys for watching. I'm sure if Harris is available as this case grinds forward over the next years, probably uh, depending on how much of it gets thrown out, but it should be interesting. Uh, we will kind of keep an eye on this. I'm sure also Richard and both Richard and Harris on cho- social media will be following this Richard on his stream as well. I'm sure Harris will be writing yeah, additional I'll be, articles. I'll be reading it out doing silly voices on of YouTube course. as if I was a children's <laughs> entertainer, a man, a 40 year old man. <laughs> it's oh, the man. only way to keep people interested in this. It's the, uh, sadly, I will, you guys all are degenerates. Though. <laughs> also remember, because as we've pointed out, guys, the esports industry is incredibly bottlenecked and it's hard to get revenue. Make sure to sponsor to actually support us by going to factormeals.com slash horseman50 and get 50% off factor meals, yep. which will be delivered to you. They'll heat and up in a couple of minutes, six to eighteen available per week. You can change and pause or reschedule at any point in time. Just enjoy them, but support us while doing so. You greedy bastards. Exactly. <laughs> and we will have more sponsors, guys. So yes. thanks, Eris, for coming on. We will see you. Uh, we're still working on more Factor for meals, guys. For you guys. Factor <laughs> Meals. Guys. Thank you. Thank There's you. a shout out to them right here. <laughs> it's a legal, you. legal pad. Factor Meals. Do it. You are now legally obligated to go to our yeah. sponsor. Uh, Hashtag thank ad. you. <laughs> thank you, guys. Uh, and as usual, esports Delinda Est.